Gentlemen, let me kindly ask you to take the seats as we would like to proceed with our seminar. Uh, so please, we will have a coffee break later on. So uh, let me kindly ask you to, to take your seats and we will begin. Estimate Minister, Honorable Ambassadors, dear panelists and guests, as well as our remote participants. It's my pleasure to welcome you at the premises of the Embassy of the Republic of Poland in Vilnius at a seminar about the cybersecurity dimension on the Three Seas Initiative. Before I say a few words about our today's event, I would like to ask you to join me in a minute of silence for the victims of the Russian aggression on Ukraine. Thank you. We already know that consequences of the Russian invasion will be felt across the whole continent. Among others, Europe will need to build more pipelines and LNG terminals to secure our energy independence from the Russian unreliable supplier and more roads and railways to increase the military mobility. These days, we cannot imagine such investments without the cybersecurity dimension. It became more crucial than ever to choose vendors of digital solutions from countries that share the same values as we do and adhere to European Union regulations and high standards. Ultimately, it all boils down to trust, which makes relations easier and business transactions cheaper. Naturally, we will be faced with a question what European Union countries are supposed to do with providers of 5G technology from states that don't share our concerns over the Russian aggression on Ukraine. How can they be trusted if their values and viewpoints are so much different than ours? I believe our today's panelists will answer these and more questions. We will hear how the Three Cs initiative can effectively contribute to overcoming challenges caused by the Russian confrontational posture. My understanding is that digital aspects became inseparable from geopolitical consideration, and this is the reality that we have to address together in different formats, but always on the basis of shared values. Dear guests, please enjoy the conference, and I wish you fruitful discussion. Thank you. Well, maybe panelists can. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mario Shantanovich, uh, lecturer, Dr. Mario Shantanovich. Uh, so I have achieved something in, in my life. So, so, uh, so I will be the panelists for this. Uh, sorry, I'm not the panelists, not that smart yet, but I will be the moderator for this first panel. So I'll ask all of the guests to take their seats in front uh, and to come so we'll be able to talk. So. Um. Okay. Uh, so great. So as we know, the one of the main aspects and the cornerstones uh, of the Three Cs initiative is to explore 
a more robust cross-border cooperation in three fields, in energy, in transport, and something that is especially important in the 21st century is uh, digital infrastructure. So all today's projects whether, uh, in infrastructure, whether they're small scale, large scale, they have a digital layer, and this digital layer necessarily needs to be protected. So, uh, and if, so these three pillars, tra energy, transport, infrastructure, uh, they have to be supplemented by cross-border cooperation in the field of cyber security and new generation telecommunication networks. So, so the question is, how can we ensure that security and that resilience in this new reality? So we'll be trying to uh, discuss various questions related to cyber security of infrastructure and which are of particular importance in our geographic zone. Uh, so the Three Seas region, which connects 12 countries between the Baltic, uh, Black and Adriatic Seas, is of particular interest to various global actors, and some of them are very powerful and have uh, malign intentions, we believe, in the cyberspace. So the closer cooperation between the countries of our region is especially necessary. So before trying to digest those questions, I'll present our speakers and members of this panel. So first is... Paweł Jabłonski, Deputy Foreign Minister, Government Plan Potentiary for the Three Seas Initiative from Poland. Uh, Mr. Uh, Gediminas Vorwolis, Ambassador, Ambassador Plan Potentiary for Connectivity and the Three Seas Initiative from the Lithuanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Mr. Edgar Edgars Bod Bondars, Ambassador at Large for Preparation of the Three Seas Initiative Summit in Riga, which will take place, I guess, uh, in this summer or late spring. Now, uh, we also have uh, two online guests, which proves my point about the resilience and necessity to secure our connectivity in the digital space. So first, uh, please forgive me if I pronounce it wrong. So it's Mr. T. Trisalo. Ambassador at Large for Connectivity in the Three Seas Initiative from Estonia. Welcome. Yes, thank you. And it was, it was pretty good. Thank you. And we have Mr. Alan Meltzer, who is Director for the Central European Affairs Office at the State Department of the United States of America. Good, uh, good, afternoon, good afternoon. And we also have Ms. Romana Vlahutin, Ambassador at Large for Connectivity at the European External Action service of the European Union. So, as I've mentioned, the question of cybersecurity is uh, vital and we see that Russia and other international actors are trying to pose uh, serious threats in this, in the cyberspace. So I would like to uh, uh, direct my first question to Mr. Pavel Jablonski. So has Poland spotted uh, increased Russia's activity in the cyberspace during this renewed uh, phase of Russia's war against Ukraine and what can be done to achieve this higher level of security for our citizens of this region? Thank you. Thank you, for, first of all, for, for, for uh, organizing this. Thank you to the Embassy of Poland, but to all the governments that are involved, to, to all our guests. It is indeed a crucial time to discuss issues of security security in general, but cybersecurity uh, that we are focusing on is absolutely key. Uh, to answer your question, actually Russia is not trying to pose threats. Russia is already posing huge threat in cyberspace. And I am certain we also know this from uh, cooperating directly with each other with, uh, in the framework of NATO in the EU, that numbers number of cyber attacks both now during the war and also before it, before the, the, the before 24th of, of February, it not only grew, but it actually spiked. It was uh, the, the increasing number of attacks, attacks of various, on various elements of our infrastructure of uh, both uh, critical and non-critical nature was growing very dynamically. We have observed that these activities were, have been prepared for uh, quite some time before and so there were these attempts, obviously the majority of them, we managed to stop, we managed to avoid, we managed to deter them to, or, or take precaution, precautionary measures. But uh, the sign of, uh, of increase uh, is also the fact that we 
are observing how Russia and also other actors, because it's not just about Russia, but also other actors, that they are investing very heavily in uh, tools of uh, cyber warfare. Uh, this is a phenomenon that we have, we could have been observing for the past years, and this is still an ongoing process. And I don't think I need to 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 explain how dangerous this may be, as we are entering uh, now the um, hopefully uh, the time of uh, where, where where we as Europe understood better uh, how dangerous Russia can be. I th I'm not saying this for, for Central Europe, for Baltic countries, in Poland, in, in, in Latvia, Lithuania, in Estonia. We all knew how dangerous Russia may be, but I, I think it wasn't understand enough to the west of, of, of our borders. Right now, in these very dire circumstances, what Ukraine is doing is, is heroic, is brave, and it actually allows us, it actually allows all Europeans to understand better these challenges. And these challenges are obviously uh, in all sectors of security in cyberspace as well. So what we need to do, what we have been doing already, but we need to scale up, we need to increase the efforts. We need to co cooperate better across all the for a, a, for all the international formats that we are in, both within NATO, both, both within European Union, but also in respect, with respect to Three Seas Initiative. Three Seas Initiative is, is a project that is focused on three pillars, on pillars of uh, cooperation in building infrastructure in transport, energy, and digital infrastructure. And in this last pillar, cybersecurity should be absolutely uh, on top of our interest. Because if we fail to cooperate in this, if we fail to uh, have effective means how to share our experience, how to share our lessons learned from, from attacks that we experience, that we, that we manage to deter, that we manage to avoid, what measures do we take? How do we coordinate our national systems? If we fail to do it, we will be more, um, more prone to, to future attacks. This is why it is so important to create effective platform of cooperation among our countries, because we have uh, across uh, the, the, the 12 countries of the initiative, but I believe mostly, especially in the Baltic countries and Poland too, we have a lot of talent, a lot of uh, very um, dynamically developing business in, in the private sector, both in, also, and also, in the, also in, the, in the public sector and in private sector. We have a lot of, of companies that are uh, developing solutions. But in order for this to be effective, we need to scale up. In, in order to scale up, we need to cooperate. And I believe we should be today starting, or the discussion already, already is, is ongoing, but we should be focusing on how to effectively um, continue this cooperation so that this platform is a significant mechanism improving our resilience, improving our security. Thank you. So um, I would like to remind everyone that uh, the three states initiatives groups, countries, 12 countries that are from the European Union, and I would say, this is my personal opinion, I should emphasize it, that I, so I would say that Lithuania has probably not fully realize the potential of various collaboration and cooperation with Central and East European countries, uh, especially when it comes to Visegrad countries, not Poland, but other Visegrad countries, the Balkan region or the Black Sea region. So I would like to ask the question for Ambassador Gediminas Forvoli. So can the Three Seas uh, initiative be a platform to change this? And could maybe digital security be a new avenue for Lithuania to forge these new links? Okay, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for raising those uh, thought-provoking questions. Before um, uh, reflecting on them, let me first of all um, express my very big thanks to the Embassy of Poland for organizing such a, such a topical and, and, uh, event here, here in Vilnius. And uh, by the way, welcome everybody to Vilnius. I'm also very happy that Vilnius can serve as a, as a place to a meeting point to discuss uh, cybersecurity in the framework of the um, Three Seas Initiative. Uh, which I guess in current circumstances uh, becomes, uh, uh, has a really a big chance to, to, to attract attention uh, as, as a format. Uh, now, uh, regarding your question about, um, that you asked up, uh, me about uh, somehow implying that uh, Lithuania doesn't uh, invest enough in the, um, in the regional uh, frameworks, well, 
Um, I'd like to go back a little bit to, to, to in, in history uh, and, and give you some examples that actu actually prove the, the contrary. Um, uh, in my um, uh, previous life, I was dealing with the security policy. And uh, I remember very well when in, 2000, in the year 2000, the, the famous uh, Vilnius group was created, uh, or Vilnius 10 group, which was uh, advocating collectively for, for, for NATO aspirations. And in, it actually included many members of the three seas initiative countries. Um, Poland, Czech Republic, and Hungary were not, were not part of that group because uh, they acceded to NATO a little earlier. But many countries from, uh, from Balkans, from, from Black Sea Shore, and, and, and from other places, uh, other in, in, this, in this geographical space, they were part of this, of this framework. So, so for us, this, uh, this regional uh, dimension is really very, very important, and we invest a lot in it. Uh, we, of course, work hard uh, in supporting our Eastern Partnership countries as well. Um, also, we, uh, we work uh, actively with, with our Nordic Baltic uh, uh, neighbors and, of course, with the Central, Central uh, Europe and, 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 and Balkan countries and countries from, from the Black Sea uh, region. And uh, indeed, we, we, see, we see potential, definitely, we see potential in the, in the Three Seas Initiative. Uh, today, we are gathered here in this kind of public private uh, format because we have many companies present and I will maybe um, pick up one specific area, the area of fintech, uh, which is uh, quite strong in Lithuania. We are, we are a bit proud about our fintech hub, with which, which has really uh, quite, quite impressive um, uh, growth. Uh, yes, last year experienced the growth of 18% as, uh, as an industry. Uh, and, uh, and of course, in, in industries, industries like this, uh, where the, the startups are, 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 are working, for them, the main purpose is really to, 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 to put the, the, the product on the market as fast as possible, to make it popular as fast as possible. And sometimes maybe the, the cybersecurity aspects, they, they, they get maybe neglected or they do not get the necessary priority. And I think this is where uh, um, governments, but also regional frameworks like this, like the Three Seas Initiative, can be helpful in offering you know, the, um, a platform where the best practices could be shared, uh, maybe also some assistance in, in, in terms of uh, you know, financial support, uh, et cetera. So, so those frameworks, uh, um, th this kind of framework is definitely uh, would be very useful. Um, Today, also one of the issues that uh, that is on the agenda uh, is the te telecommunication, you know, and the creation of uh, 5G uh, networks. Uh, and um, uh, uh, as we know, th this uh, uh, the development of 5G will will proceed with the support of EU uh, Connecting Europe facility and the. Uh, the financial um, instrument 2127 will be used for that. Uh, and here in the region, we are, we are preparing ourselves for this uh, you know, implementation of 5G by using this uh, um, um, Rail Baltica uh, cor corridor um, uh, as a part of TNTT network. Uh, and here, uh, specifically, I think the regional dimension really comes to the front because one of the requirements to, to, to apply for the financial um, support of the Connected Union facility is that this application has to be made collectively by two, three neighboring countries. And I think uh, for our countries, in order to pro proceed with this process, we really have an interest altogether to team up and to, and to, and to approach uh, um, uh, these instruments together. And I think the Three Seas Initiative definitely could be, could be um, you know, uh, a good platform to coordinate our actions. So there, are no, there is a number of examples how we, uh, as a region, can, can, can do things together and can move connectivity together and can, can achieve a better connectivity, um, which is the whole philosophy of Three Seas Initiative, that we develop our part of Europe so that it goes to the same level as the western part of Europe. Uh, so, once again, on the Lithuanian side, uh, we have all four, uh, and, and, and of course we, we, are, we are part of the Three Seas Initiative. We have, by the way, a 
quite a um, uh, good uh, coordination system here in Lithuania. There is a work interagency working group, and we, we try to, to coordinate our actions internally. So, um, yeah, and uh, we wish uh, all the best luck to our Latvian neighbors who are now busy preparing the, the Riga summit. So, thank you very much. Thank you. So, I guess we started with Poland, a little bit north, and so we can continue that northern direction. So, as was mentioned, so the, we are facing the Riga summit, and I would like to ask Ambassador Bonder, so can you envisage uh, some future perspective areas where what that could be signal that we can could potentially see during that summit and what kind of role will do you see that cyber security will be playing uh, during that summit? Well, uh, thank you very much for organizing uh, this event and very wonderful uh, Palais uh, in Vilnius. Thank you, Embassy of Poland. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Poland and all the colleagues, and uh, Vilnius is a very warm and uh, beautiful city, <laughs> really. Uh, well, if we are looking back to evolution of three seas uh, summits, then uh, we see that starting first summit, which was held in Dubrovnik in 2016, uh, then uh, um, after that summit uh, in, in uh, Warsaw, uh, and uh, Bucharest and uh, others and uh, Tallinn and Sofia and Ljubljana uh, in every summit every year there was a uh, very important development in idea of summits. I think Riga also have some challenge and uh, the geopolitical situation and uh, all the our intentions are giving good ground for <coughs> Uh, for uh, Riga summit uh, to be also remembered by something new and something uh, what never was uh, in previous summits. Um, I would like uh, to, um, well, first of all, Riga summit will be held in 20, 21st of June this year. And the uh, main topic, the pillars, of course, uh, already were mentioned. It's uh, transport, uh, digital and um, energy. And I would like to say that uh, cybersecurity is uh, really not um, attached only to digital panel, but it's more comprehensive and it, uh, it is covering also uh, the other pillars of uh, Three Seas Initiative. Um, speaking about the uh, cybersecurity platform, it is really time for effective cooperation uh, among the all uh, all uh, services and uh, all the uh, institutions which are already working on in some cybersecurity platforms which are several in, in Europe already but the um, very good idea is to um, involve the private sector and I think it's uh, really great that we have uh, in the second part of the seminar, experts from uh, private sector, and we will hear a lot of uh, opinions about uh, how more effective uh, the possible cybersecurity platform uh, should work. Because um, I think this is also cybersecurity is, of course, more than uh, more than only fight uh, of to disinformation. It covers also uh, fields of. Uh, um, Com it's have a commercial aspect like uh, supply chains and uh, quality um, and resilience of uh, supply chains, uh, how to uh, protect market. Uh, it also have um, social um, issues, a social angle, like uh, how to improve digital skills for a population, how to involve society uh, in... Uh, improving of those digital skills uh, to understand the digital needs of society at the end. So, and I think, uh, therefore, uh, um, cyber security platform uh, should be a really effective instrument uh, within 3C's initiative. So, um, I would stop here and uh, thank you very much and uh, wish good conversation. So, okay, thank you. So, again, moving further north, so we should remind everyone that uh, Estonia was working on cybersecurity before, has had been working on cybersecurity before it was cool. Uh, and so last year, Estonia proposed to launch the so called Trusted Connectivity, a framework for a free, open, and connected work. So I'd like to direct my question now to Ambassador Riisalo. 
uh, to elaborate a little bit more on this concept, how can it be implemented and how does he see this, this, con this concept in the context of what has been said during the last few minutes here? Yes, uh, thank you and uh, thank you for having me and, and greetings uh, uh, from Houston, Texas. Uh, uh, it's early morning here. So uh, maybe at first I, I would like to tell a little story uh, that recently sort of was part of my life coming here to Houston is uh, to illustrate uh, what, uh, what we are doing is important. And in the flight over the ocean, which is quite long, the Atlantic Ocean, I um, managed to, after reading my 200 emails, I managed to watch a film. And, and this film was about Alan Turing, uh, a person who cracked the Enigma code in a, in a group of mathematicians during the Second World War in, in UK. And it was a team effort. But uh, what was sort of most interesting in this story or, or caught my attention is that uh, they were actually stuck in several occasions in this monumentous task. But what actually helped them forward was the communication. The communication not only between this group of mathematicians, but also with other people involved and also this these women and girls who actually recorded these messages uh, that uh, that uh, Nice Germany warships and uh, and so on uh, exchanged, and and I think this illustrated very much uh, why why the cooperation is important, and and in the end, you know, cracking this code shortened the war considerably for years. The experts say and saved tens of millions of lives. So uh, I hope that that our Ukrainian friends will crack their code also. And we certainly help them to, to win their war. And uh, going now to, to um, describing trusted connectivity. So the, the concept, yes, uh, we're trying to promote is actually about, uh, basically about the same thing. It's about cooperation. We know that uh, there is a huge lack of, of uh, infrastructure. And of course, uh, not only in a digital sphere, but, uh, but uh, also in, in uh, transportation, in, in energy grids, and uh, not only in Europe, but also rest in the world. And, uh, and we also know that, that building these connections for the 21st century, they have to be secure. And, uh, and certainly uh, the cybersecurity aspect in building these networks is extremely important. But what is the, the point of the Trusted Connectivity Initiative is that, uh, that uh, uh, for trusted connectivity to actually happen, to realize in the world, uh, we, we need uh, uh, strong cooperation so that the efforts that different countries and regions like, you know, European Union now collectively with uh, Global Gateway Initiative, like uh, United States and, and, and G7 uh, with the uh, Build Back Better World Initiative, like Free Seas Initiative and, and others, that uh, they support each other and uh, don't actually uh, duplicate uh, the, the, the un in an unnecessary way. So uh, from a spe Estonian perspective, certainly any kind of cooperation is important so that our efforts, uh, the, the result of our efforts, the sum of our efforts becomes more than its uh, components uh, taken uh, separately. So I appreciate uh, again uh, for inviting us to the event and, and I certainly stress the, the importance of, of uh, cooperation and certainly also in the field of, uh, of cyber security which is uh, sophisticated and, uh, and uh, full of challenges that we only can uh, uh, tackle when we work together and when we exchange information. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So I think, you know, we will try to experiment and add the fourth sea, the North Sea, you know, because uh, Brussels is, uh, is, is, is or, or, or Belgium, let's say, is near the North Sea. So the question to Ambassador 
Well, Putin, how 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 does it? Uh, how do you see this uh, three seas initiative in the wider EU connectivity plans? Uh, because you know one of the reasons why this initiative was created so that the, is because these these countries want to catch up in terms of connectivity that they see that their Western partners have. Well, thank you first. That microphone. Start. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me both uh, here in Vilnius, where I'm having uh, very interesting uh, bilateral discussions, and uh, at the Embassy of Poland, which I understand is one of the most beautiful embassies in town. So thank you very much. Uh, and also um, regards, in a way, from my hometown of Dubrovnik, where uh, this whole um, journey started. Uh, I will now teleport myself to Brussels and uh, try to uh, join a little bit of uh, what we are trying to do on connectivity in general through the global gateway communication and how it uh, adds up to what you're doing and how we can reinforce uh, both, both sides. Uh, the global, global Gateway is the European Union's uh, global strategy for connectivity or, or strategic infrastructure. Uh, it is uh, indeed about really looking at the uh, connectivity space, be it transport, energy, digital, or human, uh, through a strategic lens making clear priority choices, scaling up, pooling resources and, and capabilities, because connectivity has increasingly becoming one of the key strategic uh, tools of the 21st century. The consequences of doing or not doing connectivity are structural and long-term. They are economic, they are uh, political, and uh, they are very much security-based. Uh, and I think uh, this, this issue deserves our utmost, utmost attention. And when you ask me about the cooperation between the Three Seas Initiative and the Global Gateway, especially in, in terms of the, the space on, on our borders, whether it's uh, eastern border or I would say the enclave of the Western Balkans, uh, I think it's only natural. Uh, it's really absolutely the same, the same logic. And there are, there are four elements which I think are absolutely necessary to be sort of followed through in order to reinforce each other's work. Uh, the first one is I think we need to look as, at this space uh, in a coherent way. This is one space in a way because neither connectivity nor security either start or stop at the border. Uh, and I think we really need conceptually to look at it, the space of like-minded countries and those who share our values and ideas as one. Uh, and in that sense, I think we have to upgrade also our take on the basic infrastructure, on, on uh, you know, uh, cabling that is important to be there so that we can connect in, the, in, the, in, in, that, in that sense. The second element is uh, really boosting up and providing technical assistance to our partners, sharing, uh, sharing everything that, that we know. Uh, I will just mention that the European Union, among dozens of programs for uh, our neighbors on the, on the eastern and then uh, southeastern border, um, I would just mention EU for digital Ukraine. Uh, we have invested around $25 million uh, dollar, I'm sorry, euros uh, from 220 to 224, and I hope that it also helped boost, uh, I think, a fascinating work that our friends in Ukraine are doing when it comes to, to cyber. Um, the third element is um, really a true uh, value added that three seas initiative countries can bring to this, um, to this work with the neighbors, and that's uh, situational awareness and knowledge and trust. I think it's an essential element on, on working together on all things digital. Um, uh, in, in, and I really cannot um, think of a better bridge or a better connector than the Three Seas Initiative countries. And finally, um, I think it's important for us to understand that our norms and standards uh, cannot function in isolation from very strong industrial base. I think we really need to look at it in an integrated way and invest as much as possible to strengthen the industrial base 
because this is what will model um, the, the quality that we, um, we need in terms of the, the working on the, on the cyber, um, cyber communication. So um, I really think, um, you know, there is a lot of um, very quick learning curve uh, happening. And uh, we have really, as the European Union, when you look at, at figures, when you look at facts, when you look at the reality, we have a huge capacity to, uh, to act very decisively in this way. Uh, what I think what we need to do is connect the dots and just uh, move uh, in, in, a, in a very decisive and strategic way. Okay, thank you. So again, and then moving out now even further beyond an even bigger sea. So uh, I'd like to ask, you know, remind everyone, first of all, that of course, when we're talking about cybersecurity, uh, digital security, we have to take in mind w the country that is one of the leaders in this sphere. So obviously this is the United States of America. So I would like to ask Mr. Uh, Alan Metzer, so how can the Three Seas Initiative generally add to the overall security in our transatlantic community and can we expect, uh, what kind of engagement can we expect from the United States in this uh, Three Seas Initiative in, in, in any sort of way? Thank you. Well, thank you very much and allow me to begin by um, thanking our Lithuanian uh, hosts um, for, for hosting us virtually and uh, in some cases, and also our, our uh, Polish uh, colleagues for organizing this important forum. Um, you know, in, in many ways, the security paradigm for the region and really for the broader North uh, transatlantic space profoundly changed on February 24th with uh, Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine. The new circumstances have made our cooperation through fora such as the Three Seas Initiative um, ever more important. Um, one of the things we've seen, and, and uh, as an earlier speaker referenced, is the substantial uptick in uh, malign activity uh, in the cyber sphere at the outset of this, um, of this unjustified war. And inherent in the infrastructure focus of the Three Seas Initiative, of course, is the need um, for cybersecurity and for the promotion of democratic principles um, in the in information and communications policy. Russia's abandonment of the norms of the civilized world in the sphere of hard security remind us of the risk posed to digital and cybersecurity. Resilient networks uh, are absolutely critical in the 21st century. They are the foundation of the economy of, of all the three seas countries and of course of the US as well. The nations that make up the three seas initiative and of course your partners on this side of the Atlantic understand the importance of an open interoperable secure and reliable internet subject to a multi stakeholder model of governance. This allows the freedom to innovate and develop new technologies. Uh, it, it also um, allows for the development of uh, innovation in terms of cybersecurity, which is obviously um, one of our great concerns today. Turning to, to the second part of your question, um, the US is um, and will remain a strong supporter of the Three Seas Initiative. As many of you know, the US Development Finance Corporation, um, or DFC, has offered an initial loan of $125 million, which is based on the size of those projects in the 3SI pipeline, which DFC is able to support under its authorizing legislation. DFC is right now actively engaged with Amber Capital, the investment advisor of the Three Seas Investment Fund, to uh, iron out the terms of this loan. We very much hope the Three Cs uh, Investment Fund will accept this initial offer of support. Uh, and we believe that DFC financing through this loan provides a catalytic role in developing um, 
in, 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 in driving economic development and growth across the region. But let me add that while the DFC's offer is the single largest offer of our of US support to the Three Seas Initiative, and acknowledging that due to its legislative mandate, there are limits on what the DFC is able to do, we are providing considerable additional support to our Three Seas partners on a bilateral and regional basis. For example, in Romania, uh, US military support for the development of the Romanian Cyber Defense Command uh, has been extensive um, across multiple spheres. In Bulgaria, we are funding a cyber advisor um, and providing $8.1 million in foreign military financing uh, to help the Bulgarian Ministry of Defense train and equip its cyber center. Moreover, the US Department of Energy is assisting the Baltic Synchronization Project, which will greatly enhance grid security uh, prior to desynchronization. The Department of Energy is also organizing training for Romanian and Croatian energy com uh, companies in critical areas of cyber uh, security. And in June, the FBI and Department of Energy will support uh, the uh, CC4ES, an energy grid focused uh, cybersecurity event led by the Polish transmission operator PSC. These are but a few examples of our deep cooperation with the Three Seas Initiative and Three Seas member states. Both um, our, our, our direct work through the Three Seas Initiative. Uh, and our bilateral and regional efforts, like the ones I just outlined, are all intended to support the uh, goal of the Three Cs uh, initiative of creating truly secure and resilient partners in the Three Cs Three C space. And we look forward very much to strengthening this cooperation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So, again. Uh... Ambassador Vlahutin has raised this, this, this what she called digital Ukraine. Uh, Mr. Mr. Meltzer has also talked about this context of Ukraine. So, um, and we we see that you know Ukraine has demonstrated uh, strong capabilities in the cyberspace, in the cybersecurity. And I, I personally could say that in maybe before uh, before the February 24th, uh, may, many not only in the West but in this region thought that Ukraine might be a liability in various cooperation platforms, but we more and more see that Ukraine could be uh, some kind of asset, right? So I'd like to ask my questions for all the panelists, uh, voluntarily to answer. So how can the Three Seas initiatives and its tool provide some kind of, of support and assistance, whether uh, in uh, joint projects in the fields of cybersecurity or some kind of in some sort of way to, to assist the post-war reconstruction of Ukraine uh, maybe we could invite Ukraine in, 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 into the future summits in Riga or something else. So how do you see Ukraine in this Three Seas Initiatives con context? Uh, does it have a place here? So please, uh, I, th I think we can try maybe to repeat the order. So I'll ask Mr. Pavel Yablonski to start then. Before I answer to the question of Ukraine, the immediate question of Ukraine, I'll, I'll address some of the remarks that have been uh, that have been mentioned during the the, the first the first uh, part of our session, uh, because they are uh, very much connected. Actually, if we want to be more resilient, we need to start at our own home, uh, and obviously looking what could happen to. I think every country in our region, as we observe the Russian attack on Ukraine, we need to prepare for for uh, any scenario now, and we are all perfectly aware of this. Ukraine is not a liability. It's it actually would be a liability to leave Ukraine out of our cooperation. We are fully supportive of engaging more with Ukraine, of uh, inviting Ukraine to cooperate with us uh, on la much larger scale than 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 done before. Uh, we are very open to the idea of, of, of having Ukraine as a guest or even as a partner country to the Three Seas Initiative and also as a future member. Why not? We are looking at a long-standing cooperation. We should be inviting our Ukrainian friends to join us, especially that they have expressed desire 
to be our partners in this. Now, when we are speaking about the means how to develop this, it is very important that it is not only uh, limited to, to, to repeating how important this cooperation is, but actually doing something in practice, doing something to actually bring together the stakeholders that can not only talk, but act, well, also act. And it's very good, for example, that the US are very supportive. From the very beginning, this initiative wouldn't be able to even start probably without uh, with strong political support of, of US, bipartisan support. It was about the uh, administration, first of President Obama, then President Trump, now President Biden, and also uh, bipartisan support in the Congress which is uh, a strong element of, of our cooperation here. But we need to do our job as well. We can't rely on some support or, or some loans. We are not loan-based economy. We want to be investment-based economy. We want to attract more investors. In order to do this, we need to create conditions for it. That is why we believe that in the spirit of what has been already uh, talked about uh, starting in Tallinn, about in, in, the, in the summit of the three seas in 2019, then also in, in Tallinn Digital Summit and on many other forums, this idea of, of uh, Tallinn consensus for trusted connectivity that Teeth was raising, it's, uh, that we are fully endorsing, it was already endorsed uh, also in the, in the declaration in, 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 in Sofia, we should build on this, we should build on this, and we should uh, be doing what we can to bring together the actual stakeholders. So what we propose, and we, I think this should be a topic for, for, for our discussion, for concrete actions, is to bring together stakeholders from three key sectors when it comes to cybersecurity. First, obviously, are the agencies, public authorities, because we create the legal framework, we, all, we can also provide funding, we can provide all the mechanisms with, without which it is difficult sometimes to create something, especially on, on a multinational level. Then the providers, the producers of, uh, of, of, uh, of tools and soft services, uh, suppliers of, of software, suppliers of hardware, this is absolutely essential to have homegrown solutions, homegrown, when I'm speaking, speaking about home, I mean the region, because we are able to do this. And then the recipients, the recipients, so the, the, the businesses from the sectors that are especially vulnerable for cyber threats, banking sector, but also other critical infrastructure, as Edgar was saying, it is not just about the digital pillar, it's about all the other pillars, and also about other sectors that are even not mentioned here, because in every sector we will be digitalizing, we'll be getting more into cyberspace as the 5G technology will be will become more uh, more popular, we will become more available. So we need to bring these three, uh, three types of stakeholders together, create a platform that would allow them to easily exchange their experiences, their, their, their needs, their products, their offers, so that we are able not only to talk about this, but also to create solutions that we will be able to use ourselves and also to sell them to to to, to sell them to on, on even on commercial basis because this has to be market driven force uh, to to sell, sell them as a joint product of the three C's initiative. We have we have the abilities, we have enormous uh, capability in terms of uh, especially of, of, of business of, of private sector of NGOs that are already working on this. We have we have a Polish NGOs that uh, we will be taking the floor later. How they uh, what, what they have done uh, in the in the field of, of cybersecurity is also is also worth uh, commending. We want we need to scale this up because this will bring much more investment. This will bring much more resilience. This will bring much more security, not just to our region but also globally. Cybersecurity can be a, a sort of a brand for Three Seas Initiative. Three Seas Initiative can be uh, a global brand uh, that is associated with cybersecurity. Thank you very much. Working, yes. Yeah, Ukraine, <laughs> it's now on everyone's mind and uh, this country is courageously fighting uh, against Russia on land, uh, on the seashore, uh, still in the air, and, and also in the cyberspace, courageously and effectively, as, as it has been said. Uh, and uh, therefore, um, this, uh, we, are, we are providing Ukraine with you know, military hardware and, and uh, 
all sorts of uh, assistance, but I think the assistance that we can provide to Ukraine in the cyber sphere and by using cyber tools is just as important and, and, and should not be uh, underestimated. And some assistance is going to Ukraine. I, I will use one example, uh, European example, actually. Um, there is this, you might know that there is this EU cyber rapid reaction team that was uh, created uh, a few years ago by, by a number of like-minded countries, uh, uh, Lithuania being a, a lead country. We have Lithuania, Croatia, Estonia, Poland, Romania, and Netherlands. Uh, so it's a very agile uh, tool. It's a kind of uh, cyber security rapid response force, if, if, if I may say so. And, uh, and actually Ukraine, uh, they, they knew about the existence of this tool and, uh, and uh, they, they requested themselves, they, uh, uh, they asked the European Union for this tool to be deployed and the EU responded uh, expeditiously and positively and they, they, uh, they offered this assistance. Uh, the, the cyber, um, this um, cyber rapid reaction team didn't, I mean, was not deployed physically to Ukraine, but uh, but uh, it continues uh, the monitoring of the situation and assisting Ukraine with the, uh, identifying the the, the 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 support needs. So uh, this kind of assistance, I think, is is tremendously important. And uh, and what what this episode teaches us is that actually collective action of of a group of like-minded countries uh, can can make a difference, can can offer a concrete support. It also, um, it also um, um, says, says that there is a merit in, in, in teaming up, uh, maybe even regionally, uh, indeed, as it has been suggested. Uh, and TRISI's initiative could be uh, uh, s s such a platform. And, and also, it, uh, what it says is, it says that the developing of specific, uh, very practical uh, uh, cap capabilities is key. So uh, being practical, as Ms. Mr. Minister said in his, 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 his in the beginning of his intervention, is very important. Um, and and uh, I wish that uh, in this framework of the TC's initiative, we also have this aspect in mind of pra what practically, uh, what kind of difference we can make in this in this framework. Because it's true that there is a no there are a number of tools out there already. Um, be it you know EU Center of Excellence for Cybersecurity, NATO Center of Excellence for Cybersecurity, especially on doc doctrinal level, there are there are many instruments that that are that are already active in this sphere. But uh, but there is definitely a merit on on looking at it regionally as well, and uh, by 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 creating uh, some some practical tools that that can be useful also in the situations like the one we we we, we have in Ukraine now. Thank you. Thank you very much. I completely agree what was just said uh, from uh, my colleagues and uh, I would like to just add that uh, <clears throat> 3C's initiative, in my opinion, is a very good platform where uh, uh, re reconstruction of Ukraine uh, can go and uh, this should attract, this possibility should attract attention not only within EU, not only transatlantic uh, uh, but also uh, in much wider scale. Um, also, I would like to inform you that uh, a couple of days ago, my president, Mr. Egil Slavitz, had a co phone conversation with uh, Vladimir Zelensky, and uh, a Ukrainian president was invited uh, to Three Seas Initiative uh, Summit. Uh, he uh, gladly accepted the invitation and depending on the ob obstacles, uh, he will join uh, the presidential panel live or in person. So, thank you very much. Looking forward. Thank you. So, uh, Ambassador Riesolo, what what is your take on this? I should agree with uh, with the you know, people who have already spoken about this issue and and uh, and actually if we look at uh, sort of the aim of the Three Cs uh, initiative, uh, the aim of Three Cs investment funds, uh, we we can't, uh, you know, realize our, our um, targets uh, when we look at the map and ignore Ukraine there. So this has been clear for Estonia from the very beginning. So if, if, if we plan to create uh, a new tense infrastructure in, the, in, the, in our countries, in the, in the, in the areas of a, of a new Europe, then uh, it is logical and in, inevitable that, uh, that Ukraine is part of this uh, space. 
uh, and uh, yes, uh, Estonia has been a supporter of involving Ukraine in, in one or another way also for, for a long time already, actually. President Zelensky was also invited as a guest to Tallinn summit. And, uh, and but unfortunately, then COVID crisis uh, didn't enable us to, to have the Tallinn summit in a, in a full scale format. So definitely we, we continue this support and we just have to agree uh, what role they want to take and, and what is what is acceptable uh, to 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 all the all other existing member states. Uh, what concerns cooperation with Ukraine uh, then uh, in in building up the country after the war, which we we um, we hope can can start soon. Uh, of course, uh, we have experience Estonian specialists have been working like I think Latvian Lithuanian and Poland Poles also in Ukraine for years building up you know the the rule of law uh, uh, giving uh, help in in building up the, the, the IT uh, networks and and uh, and e state of, of uh, Ukraine uh, Estonian uh, X road is actually the, the basis also of the Estonian uh, E government uh, with, a, with the name Trambita there, but but basically the the same technology. So we we are already in in some sense in the in the same uh, the room. Uh, but I would also like to say, and especially uh, cons what concerns uh, cybersecurity and and these issues, I think uh, when this uh, war is over, Ukraine has a lot to teach us, and and not in the only in the courage. And 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 how to to sort of uh, stand against a much bigger enemy, but but real life knowledge, and and also I think in 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 in, in the areas we, we are concentrating today. I just yesterday saw a, a clip from from Ukraine where sort of very smartly organized, actually civil people uh, have organized uh, uh, sort of a drone units uh, to to discover. Uh, uh, Russian, uh, Russian, uh, you know, operations, Russian uh, positions of of of, uh, of uh, uh, military equipment, and and it works pretty well. So uh, certainly, cooperation in Ukraine is not is just what we what we need, but it it will be a must for us. Thank you. Thank you. So, Ambassador Vakutin. Let me let me maybe just starting with paraphrasing a little bit uh, our colleague from from the U.S. I don't think that the 24th of February marked the profound change. I think the profound change happened already before, but just it brought it into our face, and I think we it was it became fully evident, uh, and and we are now witnessing um, really a parallel a parallel war in a way there is a kinetic war on the ground and there is a cyber cyber war in in in, in that space and indeed uh, there is a lot that we will have to learn and are already learning from ukraine uh, in terms of, of of skills and and demonstrated strengths but also the importance of really having trusted friends because i think there is a lot of assistance also in this uh, in this dimension not only from the Three Seas Initiative uh, states and, and EU as such, but also from friends, uh, friends all around uh, all around the world. I remember reading a tweet of the Ukrainian Minister of, of uh, Information and Technology asking Elon Musk to come and help with a with a smovable satellite, and and it was delivered in a very short period of time. And I think trusted friendship is something that we should sort of remind ourselves of. Uh, again, because in situations like this, it's of crucial, crucial importance. Uh, I also think it, uh, it um, taught us a lesson, not only of resilience, but the importance of projection. Our projection and early move and, and ability to really um, be proactive in, in securing, uh, in securing uh, uh, cyber, uh, cyber uh, communication space. However, I think we also uh, have to understand there is still a lot of work to be done. Uh, because our main sort of reference uh, field is our world or the Northern Hemisphere. I think there is a lot of work to be done also uh, in the South, uh, a lot of reaching out and a lot of explaining and a lot of uh, engagement. 
Uh, and in terms of uh, rebuilding uh, Ukraine, uh, EU will be very much central to all the efforts that are going to be put into, into that massive work. And I think with a new opportunity to really get the whole connectivity logic uh, right in terms of either transport, energy, digital connectivity, and also, also the human dimension. Uh, and uh, in that, we will definitely also count on our partners, our partners like Japan, our partners like the US, our partners all over, all over the world that have already been standing with us and I am absolutely sure will help us uh, in this endeavor in the future as well. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Meltzer, we'd also like to hear your opinion uh, on, on this matter. Yes, thank you. Um, we've been working, of course, on um, strengthening Ukraine's defenses, both kinetically and in the cybersphere, for quite a number of years now. Um, I, I don't have the details at hand, but but in the cybersphere, they have been very extensive um, in, in multiple areas, and and that will continue. It is continuing and will continue. Um, the Ukraine Supplemental Appropriations Act, passed just a couple of weeks ago by Congress and signed by President Biden, provides an additional 13.6 billion dollars of assistance for Ukraine. Some of that. Uh, will be uh, in the cybersphere and working towards increasing further resilience in key sectors such as energy, uh, communications, transportation, and so forth. So it's been an ongoing project for a number of years, and the funding has been appropriated to continue this work going forward as well uh, to ensure that Ukraine um, remains resilient uh, in the face of this unprecedented threat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, for all the panelists for answering this question, the last question, but I'd like to especially thank Mr. Pavel Yablonsky for his answer because he also managed to answer my sec next question uh, because he already touched upon about the what I wanted to ask is how to make the three C's initiative more practical, right? More operational. So Mr. Yablonsky has talked more much about it because, you know, lately uh, in the maybe in the in the public sphere, uh, in in the media, there was maybe a little bit of criticism towards various initiatives that you know we have uh, lots of high level political dialogue, but maybe not enough of practical uh, uh, things solved. So I'd like to ask the other panelists: How can we make the three C's more practical, more operational, with the focus you know on the cybersecurity digital sphere? So I guess we can we can I can stick to the order again. Well, um, I think a lot a lot of ideas have already been put on the table. How how three C's initiative can be used as a platform? Um, well, first of all, it's a it's a political framework, so uh, it it gets all the attention when our leaders come together uh, every year. They sit together, they discuss. Uh, the, uh, the most uh, burning issues together, and this creates some sort of synergy already, intrinsic synergy in the region. So, so this political meaning of this initiative should not be underestimated either. But in terms of, of, of uh, it's, I mean, how practically can we uh, use it to, to, to do things together? I think what, what we've been saying also already so far, that the cybersecurity element, that uh, it can serve as a platform to, to, to exchange ideas uh, in this particular area. Uh, also a platform maybe to, to work on, on cyber maturity and the digital awareness uh, with our private sector in particular in, 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 the, in, the, in different countries of, of, of 3C's initiative. Also, what I, I, I said in my introduction about the telecommunications, that I think this is a, also a perfect platform to, 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 to think together about the, uh, you know, the um, uh, infrastructure, of infrastructure of tomorrow, 5G and, and uh, other type of infrastructure. Uh, but of course, th this dialogue has to be structured. We need to you know, make priorities. We cannot do everything also in the three Cs. We cannot uh, you know, just... Uh, uh, copy from 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 other bigger bigger um, uh, platforms. 
uh, and always l we have to look for for practical uh, practical areas uh, that we could do here on the on the regional level uh, and and ukraine and i think all the neighboring uh, regions come come, come into mind uh, immediately when because indeed they, they all talk about the reconstruction of ukraine uh, that will need to be carried out uh, in, uh, after after one, hopefully once this 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 war is over i think the countries from the region they will have the knowledge uh, and they will have the connections uh, already with ukraine uh, and and this will have to be used and and treaties can certainly be a, a place uh, to you know to to bring all those uh, all this knowledge together thank you I think I'll just repeat uh, in some essence uh, that uh, Three Seas Initiative, uh, it's a um, public and private cooperation, effective cooperation. More projects, more investments, and uh, this will help to fulfill the uh, starting slogan of Three Seas Initiative. That Three Seas Initiative is politically inspired and commercially driven. Thank you. Okay, so our, our another we like to ask here the view from the third Baltic country from Estonia. Microphone. Um, Estonians Estonians are, are well known for for the to being practical people. So. Uh, we would like to return to maybe some of our, our pretty long time standing uh, proposals that uh, that to be effective, we have to be organized. So we still think that uh, this is important to have a, a permanent uh, free sea secretariat that can sort of handle the, the, the issues, uh, you know, in, in organizational level, in, in communication, so we will be better, better visible. And of course, can also then have cooperation formats on it uh, that uh, that are you know dedicated to to certain fields. For for example, uh, uh, cybersecurity. And and uh, second project we are we are working on in the framework of the of the free seas investment fund is the idea that uh, that um, you know it's it's mainly targeted uh, right now to to sort of hardcore big infrastructure projects. But uh, there is an idea to, to also maybe establish um, a free seas innovation fund in the, in the framework of this fund or, or in the size of it. And this certainly can also start to work with a, with a project in, with, with smaller tickets and, and specifically in mind in the IT and, and also sectors that, that support uh, the cybersecurity. So these are maybe the two practical steps I, I, I would like to, to highlight. Thank you. Thank you. So we'd like to share some uh, experience in, in, in pr practicality from, from our Western uh, partners, right? So from, from the European... I don't, I don't think there is West and East anymore. Uh, and I think this, uh, there's a completely new dimension that we will be paying far more attention that's North-South. And this is exactly the line and, and the connection between the Three Seas Initiative, initiative countries that goes from north to the south of Europe, and I think will go even further further south and will branch. Uh, so I think this is one uh, important paradigm change in a way, because our world outlook, at least in Europe post-Cold War, was east-south, and, and a lot of uh, you know infrastructure was, was basically trying to bridge that gap, but then another gap remained, remained open, and that is something that needs to be tackled. From a very practical uh, point of view, I think we all need to be um, to have patience in a sense, because when you talk about strategic infrastructure, you're really talking about a marathon. You're not talking about things that can be built within a week or a month or a year. It's something that needs proper structural analysis and proper structural planning. Uh, and when you think about the European Union itself, it was built through connectivity. So we do have uh, a lot of instruments that are available to us. We just need to look at those instruments and see which are the most useful and how do we link them to the instruments that are needed to sort of anchor our immediate neighborhood to what we are doing. We really cannot make uh, mistakes of having this sort of mental border which 
simply uh, we can't afford anymore in the in the 21st century. This doesn't exist anymore. We have to to look at it in a, in a far broader way. Uh, and three elements. Um, the political element is very practical because the political element has to put out the priorities. So. Um, there is a direction that, that will have to be decided. The second practical element, again, we need to look at the instruments and we, to, we need to, to, to um, make a good selection, good pooling, and understand whether some of the instruments need a bit of upgrade or, or change and to understand how to, to have them work more efficiently for us. And finally, we really, really, really need to partner with the private sector. The amount of investment that is needed for uh, for uh, infrastructure is just so massive that public sector can only be a sort of support guarantee seed money. But we need to build trust relationship with the public sector, uh, with the private sector, where they would want to come and work work with us on a large scale uh, infrastructure projects. And uh, again, there is there is work to be done there, but I think this is the only way way to go. Thank you. And Mr. Metz, uh, what is your take on that? Um, just very briefly, from the outside, um, as a friend of, of the Three Seas Initiative and strong supporter, we wouldn't presume to suggest what ways to make it um, more operational. But the Three Seas Initiative uh, reflects our own priorities and we'll look to support whatever directions you choose to uh, move it in. Okay, so yes, yes. I know I took the floor on this. You're welcome. Uh, before, just a couple of, couple of remarks also in terms of the practicality, because I think we are uh, sitting here among four countries, among three Baltic states and Poland, but we should not overlook other partners in the three seas. And well, we've been preparing to, to this seminar. I also spoken to several ambassadors in Warsaw, for example, the Czech ambassador. I don't think we need to, we need, we, we need not to remind ourselves that the principles of Prague Declaration with trusted approach to 5G, uh, and this is, I think, everybody subscribes to it. This is reflected also in EU toolbox for this. We have a lot in common, and this is yet another element how to put that in practice, because if we are co going to continue our cooperation in, in this regard, base our cooperation on trusted multi-stakeholder uh, suppliers, which obviously also means that we are not um, cooperating with, the, with those untrusted uh, providers. I think this is also very important also for external investors, for external partners, hugely important to be resilient also in the tra transatlantic dimension. Thank you. So thank you very much uh, for, those, for your ideas and how to make it more operational and practical. As a member of a uh, representative of Vilnius University, a little bit sorry and pity that we haven't heard anything about universities, but you know, as we say, it's a marathon. Uh, so I, this is my last question, uh, but I think we might have after that question one or well, three, four minutes or something. So maybe one, we can take one, two questions from the audience if there will be some kind any. So, Okay, so 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 my last question again, as as again, Mr. Jabłonski has mentioned, right? So that we have here representatives from the Baltic Sea, both on the ground and online, and we know that Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland uh, have been cooperating and working close in many, many, many areas. So my last question would be for for my for for our Baltic see panelists you know could, could could these four countries you know play at this more leading role in promoting innovation connectivity and 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 and, and cyber and cyber security so i can uh, we can we can start whoever whoever wishes to go first and well but let's give the the floor for the host of the of the of the riga summit then Well, <clears throat> the cyber world is so connected that it would be impossible to uh, jump out of, uh, and, you know, to make someone special. So I think the region, uh, big advantage for, for our uh, Three Seas Initiative region is readiness to uh, make innovations, uh, to, to bring them to life. And uh, not only Baltics, but the uh, other countries also have a lot of good things in cybers, uh, cyber uh, IT uh, issues and um, innovations. So uh, 
I think we are uh, more or less equal and, and we have to uh, move forward like that. Thank you. So other Baltic uh, Sea countries, do they have something to add to this? We are also at the Baltic Sea. <laughs> uh, what's, what, what Edgar said, what's, what's also very important, we are uh, doing what I think this is also have been the driving force of the Three Seas Initiative. It was never a project that acquired uh, long political deliberations before we take action. The approach is different. We take a group of initiative of, of, of like-minded countries that want to drive the change, that want to drive is, fo is forward, and so far the others were joining on other initiatives too. And in this regard, the cybersecurity is actually at the top of interest of, I think, every member of, of, of the Seas Initiative. I mentioned Czech Republic, but there is also very huge interest in Slovenia, in Croatia, in, in Romania and Bulgaria, very big, very big uh, interest. We also work together with our partners in Hungary, in Slovakia. We um, need to do this, and we see that this interest is uh, going to be uh, increasing. And I think we should invite everyone also from outside. This is an issue of, of today, for example, and I think a very important thing to consider. We see a huge interest in... Uh, digital market for the talent from, uh, from outside, from Russia these days. Up to 70,000 Russian IT specialists want to leave the country because of what's happening in Russia. We obviously need to be very careful as we speak about security, but many of these people want to run away because they want to work in a free environment. They want to be able to create solutions also for, for security. If we are able to properly vet them to be, to be, to be safe, to be secure, why not use this? We actually started a, a program in August 2020 when the, uh, when the, when the rigged uh, elections in Belarus took place. We created a bi business harbor, Poland business harbor program to attract IT specialists from Belarus. And since then, since then we expanded that program for, to specialists from other countries, Russia included. We, now we obviously want to attract these, these specialists to even more increase the attractiveness of our market, being obviously um one hundred percent sure that there are no no threats and, and so on, so this is very very uh, thin line sometimes, but we need to be creative, we need to be open, and we need to uh, scale up all the time. This is the approach that we should have. Thank you yes, so uh, the short answer to your question is yes, we definitely would be happy to take the lead in this region, the three Baltic states and Poland. Uh, but I think for the three seas initiative to really have an impact. I think it's important. It would be important uh, to connect this regional connectivity initiative to to other, uh, you know, initiatives and and, and uh, other platforms, uh, the global gateway, to see how global gate how, how three C's initiative could plug in into global gateway because one of the aims of the global gateway is to to look into the adjacent regions, the closer neighborhood neighborhood, and and we as 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 a, as a regional platform can, platform uh, can certainly be uh, useful in, in that regard. Also, I think it's tremendously important to work with other uh, like-minded partners, like partners like Japan with their uh, um, initiatives also in the area of uh, connectivity, quality infrastructure and, and others. Uh, of course, uh, what has been said about the transatlantic partnership, uh, the Build Back Better World. So I think, the, especially in the nowadays world when we really, things have become like black and white, you know. I think for, for like-minded uh, countries and like-minded initiatives, it's a high time to, to seek synergies. And, and, and to work together to produce, to have a mul multiplier effect. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, uh, Ambassador Riesolo, your, your chance to say the last, uh, the last but maybe yes, not the least I... important word. Thank you. And, uh, and I think we, we have to try to take a, a rational look here. And of course, there are, there are you know, interests. So we, we have more common regionally. For, for example, here in, in, in Texas, I'm actually working on, on another very important aspect of trusted connectivity, and this is energy security. And, uh, and, uh, but we, we do it here together with, uh, with our Latvian colleagues, with, with close cooperation. And, and this, what we are doing, certainly influences also uh, our, our Lithuanian and, and Polish partners, because uh, we, are, we are one grid uh, connected together concerning what concerns the gas. 
but meantime already here uh, discussing these issues we understand that uh, that uh, that maybe this is more sort of a localized issue uh, but if we look at the safety of the grid of the of the of our energy infrastructure then we have a common problem all over the europe and, and of course in the free seas also so um, i think we would to take should take the same attitude that we work in the formats that are effective if it is more regional, we work together. It is, if it is broader, we, 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 we broaden the cooperation. And cybersecurity is certainly something that, uh, that is, is a common concern to, to all of us. And, and a real and uh, present danger, but we, we will prevail. Okay, so as I've mentioned, uh, you are, now will have the chance to ask the question for our panelists, and the main reason why is because the coffee break will start now. So uh, I thank everyone for, uh, for, for, to all our panelists who have come from various places here. So once again, uh, Mr. Pavel Jablonski, uh, Ambassador Gediminas Vorvolis, uh, Ambassador Edgar Bodnars, uh, Ambassador Tiet Riesalo, uh, Mr. Alan Metz, Meltzer, sorry, excuse me, from the U.S. State Department, and Ms. Romana Lahutin, Ambassador at Large for Connectivity. So we have a break now, and we'll more move then to the more practical aspect of business here. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? I guess we are almost all here. And I would like to invite the panelists on the second panel to our stage, please. Thank you very much. And first of all, I would like to invite our key speaker, Mrs. Isabella Albrecht. Uh, she's the president of the SEC Forum uh, here in Moscow. Please. Good afternoon, ladies uh, and gentlemen. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, thank you, first of all, for, for the invitation. I'm honored to be here with you uh, today. Uh, I especially appreciate the face-to-face, eye-to-eye contact after um, so many conferences enabled by digital connectivity. And I'm really glad to see also so many uh, familiar uh, faces uh, here with us today. Uh, it's also my very first visit to the beautiful capital of Lithuania, and I really value this opportunity to, to speak uh, today. Um, and starting also uh, from the personal perspective, my advocacy of the necessity to pay particular attention um, in the three C's to the needs, challenges, and threats of the digital transformation started in 2018, and Minister Jabłoński mentioned that saying that um, a, a group uh, of think tanks from the region, um, chaired by the Kościuszko Institute, uh, which I'm affiliated with, um, presented an 11-point digital plan for the digital uh, three Cs uh, in 2018. Uh, the experts jumping off point was as follows. A bright uh, future for the region will only be possible thanks to more developed cross-border digital infrastructure, as well as cooperation and coordination to boost the secure digital transformation across countries and all sectors of the economy. So we called for the upgrade of the Three Cs initiative to make it future ready and future proved. Uh, the future we uh, thought and wrote about is uh, already here with unprecedented digital transformation accelerated by COVID-19, which speed up the process of technological change. And at uh, the same time, we find ourselves as in 2022, haunted by unresolved past, the past of the Cold War, the history of imperialism, war, autocracy was brought back to Europe with the Russian aggression on Ukraine. This put us in uh, the place where we, the Central Eastern Europe and particularly border countries of the Eastern flank need to take unprecedented actions to secure our front lines, upgrade our resilience and protect our economies. Uh, this has to be done in the real world urgently, but it has to be done also in cyberspace. For several years, cyberspace has been used by cyber criminals, their principles and authoritarian regimes to conduct hostile offensive actions to achieve their geopolitical goals. The geopolitical goal of Russia is to project power over countries which uh, it perceives as its sphere of influence. It is now involving its cyber power as well. Uh, therefore, against uh, the backdrop the war in Ukraine, cyber warfare is escalating, which may reach the, a scale never seen before in history, and which aims to support the Russian military actions to achieve its geopolitical goals. Ukrainians have organized themselves to take effective cyber defense measures with an arsenal of capabilities already posed, posed, possessed by their specialized institutions, but also other actions that are increasingly important for the outcome of the war, namely offensive measures. Ukraine also added to its arsenal a government-led and tasked digital army, the IT army, made up of Ukrainian technology companies and thousands of cyber specialists. 
In the fight on the digital front, Ukraine has also asked for the help from its allies. So this cyber war may also tip the balance of power in favor of Ukraine and therefore its partners. And we the allies need to be ready for countering Russian cyber power too, which is likely to be pro projected under the threshold of this war, threaten our ICT networks and systems even on the larger scale than it is now. So what type of cyber attacks can be expected? First of all, we should assume that Russian hackers, especially those specializing in ransomware attacks, may want to take financial revenge on Western companies and entities for economic sanctions. It is uh, therefore possible that spectacular ransom demands will be made in the coming days, weeks. Then the APT saw advanced persistent uh, threats uh, and cyber attacks on critical infrastructure and industrial control systems cannot be ruled out either. In fact, we have already witnessed the Viaset hack, which is uh, arguably the largest politically known, publicly known uh, cyber attack to take place since Russia invaded Ukraine. It targeted the company's uh, satellite internet network and affected residential modems in Ukraine, but not also in Ukraine. The most worrying scenario uh, could be also attacks on the global digital infrastructure, which can result in very uh, serious disruptions uh, to the functioning of the internet. The capabilities for advanced uh, application attacks uh, are certainly there in Russia, but also in China. Ukrainians allies, most notably the US, uh, are also capable in that field and might want to use their capabilities to re retaliate and defend. Um, and while it must be stressed that cyber operations have their significant limitations in terms of physical effects, they can influence the outcome of this war to some extent and their potential should not be underestimated. On the contrary, our cyber defense capabilities should be strengthened above all. The Ukrainian example is now uh, providing, um, is now proving that we need to be united in cyber power together with uh, our EU allies within a CE region and across the Atlantic and also with like-minded countries around the world. Um, and together with our companies and cyber specialists. Uh, this is the main takeaway from the war in Ukraine, which should frame today's discussion on the need to boost cybersecurity cooperation, also in the free seas. We need uh, that boost to protect our digital economies and to strengthen our national and regional security. In the new geopolitical circumstances with uh, war on the free seas borders, we need to reframe the scope of this cooperation to make it even more security oriented. But we also must highlight the much needed cooperation in our region. In this new security landscape, uh, strengthening the region um, should be two dimensional by deepening cooperation within the B9 group, by ensuring a much greater presence of NATO troops, military facilities and infrastructure, and under the Free Seas Initiative, through infrastructure investments within each of the three pillars, digital, energy, and transportation. Military strength of the Eastern flank nowadays requires strong foundations of resilient infrastructure and technological innovations, plus cybersecurity built by design in both of them. This can be and should be delivered by the FreeSys initiative and the FreeSys initiative should be treated as a European security buffer. Security and cybersecurity is now more and more about digital infrastructure, so we should not forget to deploy secure cross-border digital highways and uh, data centers spread across the region and implement the concept of a trusted connectivity proposed by Estonia. We should consider building the transatlantic cable, the three seas, one ocean fiber optic, linking CEE directly with the US and to invest in satellite 
communication. And we should also take steps in order to secure key IT and information resources in the event of a massive cyber attack or military attack on the territory of Free Seas. Far-reaching measures to protect national digital sovereignty were taken already by Estonia after the cyber attack carried out in 2007 by Russia Federation. Estonia built a data embassy that is well-secured data center located in Luxembourg, where encrypted backups of the state's digital data are stored in the event of such an attack. In the current circumstances, in the upcoming weeks and months, we should support consistent joint uh, actions aimed at boosting cybersecurity of the region, such as, for example, cyber threat hunting, information and threat intelligence sharing, operational cooperation in terms of analytic support between certs to reinforce their awareness, readiness, and attribution capabilities. This, is, uh, this cooperation should go across all critical sectors, starting with energy and transportation. We should enhance international alliances with cyber powers like US and UK and bolster public-private partnerships with global cyber companies and national champions from the region, but also smaller companies with unique specializations. Uh, only that way we will be able to build solid resilience to cyber attacks in cyberspace. In the respect of cybersecurity capacity building and strengthening digital resilience in the long-term perspective, we should make sure that cybersecurity by design will be embedded in all infrastructure de development projects in the region, that we will create robust cybersecurity system across countries and all critical sectors of the economy, and we will deploy 5G network related security model and standards across the region based on the security by design principle and trust mentioned earlier today. We should also draw enormous resources to the region to advance technological capabilities as well as develop its homegrown ones. And it was also so mentioned uh, at the panel before uh, my, my speech. This is because we as NATO are at the verge of so-called Sputnik moment. The race for technological advantage over authoritarian powers uh, has fully started with two main competitors, which is China and Russia. It is important to underline while speaking about free seas that the countries less technologically advanced and most dependent on military support from the alliance, including Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, have the most to gain from NATO's strengthened technology policy. Since emerging and disruptive technologies accelerate cyber threats, the free seas countries should concentrate on cooperation focused also on solving particular cybersecurity problem sets enhanced by the emerging and disruptive technologies. There is also the need to implement cybersecurity by design in the um, EDT's uh, development process to not let new technology solutions be more vulnerable. On the other side, EDTs are also crucial for advancements in cyber capabilities and defenses. Therefore, the new models of innovation and application of EDTs should serve as useful and important frameworks to deal with cyber threats and to improve cyber def defense, deterrence and security, for example, with AI and quantum computing cyber solutions. That is why Diana, so Defense Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic and NATO Innovation Fund can and should be considered as frameworks to solve cybersecurity problem sets and challenges. Here it is uh, to be mentioned the latest news that the United Kingdom in partnership with Estonia will host the European headquarter of Diana program. It is a great opportunity also for free seas technological cooperation, especially that on the other side of the region, in Bucharest, there is headquarters um, of um, European Cyber Competence Center by European Commission. In the region, there are also other NATO competence centers specialized in the issues of new emerging uh, threats, 
So the Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence in Tallinn, the Counterintelligence Center in Kraków, or the Strategic Communication Center uh, in Riga. Uh, and this is definitely a favorable ecosystem. Mm, the aim for FRISIS, its companies and universities should be to gain a stronger position in the digital technology and cybersecurity value, value chain. Thanks, thanks to that. Uh, we should be then particularly underlined, uh, what should be particularly underlined is the need to develop um, a cybersecurity sector of companies and institutions able to innovate and develop major and high-tech security solutions for ICT networks and systems. That is why I'm glad to see representatives of uh, cybersecurity and ICT companies here today. The three seas countries have unique potential and may specialize in various technological cybersecurity areas. Um, it was mentioned uh, earlier today by T. Risalo, uh, the history of Enigma uh, encryption. In fact, the, the, the cooperation of mathematicians, Polish mathematicians, started in the Frisis region, then they were evacuated to London and worked with Alan Turing, so it can be a success story for our cooperation uh, in cybersecurity here in the region. Uh, and here in the region we have uh, also the same perspective of threats, um, and we should definitely establish national platforms to coordinate and develop multi-sectoral business cooperation with the focus on the development of cybersecurity solutions and emerging and disruptive technologies for security and defense. Together, we need to build the FreeSys brand as a strong cybersecurity global player with vibrant marketplace for cybersecurity products and solutions. In Poland, we have already established a cybersecurity cluster of almost 50 companies called Cyber Made in Poland. And I think that similar network can be established in every free seas country. Moreover, those clusters then should uh, start cooperate. Together, we should also strongly advocate CE region's importance and significant role for uh, securing the future growth of the EU and supporting it with relevant tangible projects which can be introduced and financed within the new multi-annual financial framework and the recovery and resilience facility. Uh, the EU itself should also provide appropriate support and the notion of understanding that the resilience of CE as a front line, also in terms of cybersecurity, means the resilience of the entire EU. Ladies and gentlemen, we are entering the future with new digitally augmented reality combined with security threats originated from the past. But what is always valid and proven over the years is the truth that united we stand, divided we fall. United in cyber power is critically important in the new normal. For all those reasons, I do think that the construction of a strong digital filler and of the cybersecurity dimension underlining also the two other uh, three C's pillars, so energy and transportation, should not only be prioritized and operationalized, but also due to uh, the Russian aggression, uh, carefully and efficiently put into practice. Uh, symptoms of geopolitical tensions have been visible in cyberspace for years. It has become a domain often used by Russia for activities below the threshold of war. Unfortunately, the threshold of war has been brutally crossed and uh, it is now uh, necessary for Ukrainians' response to the Russian attack to be broadened to include defensive and offensive actions in cyberspace as well, which is not incompatible with acting within the confines of the defense doctrine. Here too, assistance and support will be needed from the West and the free world, including the CE countries. And we also need to keep in mind that Russia is not the only threat to our security. There are other authoritarian forces and threats related to the era of strategic competition and so-called the strategic simultaneity stressed by NATO. And we will see more evidence for that too. Thank you very much. <clears throat> If you allow it, I just stand up for the two minutes, and after that I will sit. 
I'm a teacher from university, so <laughs> I behave like this. My name is Marius Lourdes and I will be just moderator of our panel. And I will introduce all the members, but before that I want just to remind some principles of, of regulation of informational technology, because a lot of speakers were talking about it. Functional neutrality, functional equality, and self-regulation. Even if you talk about cybersecurity, Technological neutrality principle says that the states should not describe one technology or one, or one just producer and so on. Consumer should choose, yes? And if the technology or pass all these requirements of the standards, so it means it's safe and everybody can use it. But at our days, it change. I passed it for, for 20 years, I'm working at university and all the time I was explaining about technological neutrality, but the consumer should choose technological. But now we see that everything change and we can state that not even the technological itself, it's very important, but the producer, beneficial owner of that, it's also very important. And I'm orientating to the question of the money. Everything was based on the money. If it's more cheaper and the lead same requirements, the passing requirements, so we should buy this one. Now at our days, the money is not a question. At our days, the question is it's more high principle. So that means, who is the owner? Who is the beneficial owner? We need to work together with allies. Functional equality means if we have two different areas, this digital space and the physical space, and if we have same legal relationship in both of the area, we need to regulate them this equal and the same. And I just want to mention one of the most important principles the states in our national security strategy. It's the same at your countries. All of you, you are adopt your national security strategies, national cyber security strategies, and we don't have any differences between the physical sphere and digital sphere. So that means we need to prepare for both of that spheres. And obligations are not just for the specific institution at the military institution and so on. Obligations are on the business also. And if we talk about preparing for the defense, it's very related to the self-regulation principle. Self-regulation is very related with the safety principle. You were mentioned a lot of times, safe and safety, cyber security safety. What does it mean safe and what you need to pass? We all know from the side of the economy of the technology, if the cracking or if you will spend more money when you can get the benefit from it, so it, that means it's safe. If you spend millions and you will get just the thousands, it's a safe system. But now, again, money is not the question. The country has the money and all that countries has a lot of money and they can spend billions of that and just to crack or break the energy system, telecommunication system, or even the reputational system of the financial sector and so on. Previous, one of the members mentioned that Lithuania is the leaders of the fintech sector and they mentioned the problem that the fintech company, they just not invest enough to the cybersecurity. Yeah, it's a problem, but now we know that the main requirements from the central bank, for example, if we talk about financial sector, is to ensure the cybersecurity level. And if not, you can just, can, we can cancel your license for the financial services and so on. So yeah, we need just to rethink about these principles and we are completely working in, in another way when it started 20 years ago. So let me introduce our speakers, today's speakers, and I will start from Ms. Yeva Ilves, Digital Policy Advisor of President of Latvia. Nice to have you here. Uh, also, Mr. Slavomir Pietrzyk, sorry for the pronunciation, President of and CEO of Wireless Company from Poland. Thank you. We are also having here Edwin Asker, the Head of Business uh, Resident Unit of Ignitis Group Lithuania. Uh, yeah, Mr. Ingmar Spuk is Vice President, Mobile tele Telecommunication Operator, Latvia. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Reiner Sachs, Member of Executive Board of Cyber X Technologies, Estonia. So, I have prepared some questions and it's more like the problematical questions. Let's start from, from, from that, that the well-educated persons we have a lot of well-educated person in the IT sector. All of the free C is initiative countries. But the most important problem in our days, if we're talking about cooperation between public entities and the private entities, that the public entities have specific requirements for education, for educational degree and so on. And the private sectors, we don't have specific requirements. We can just look at the 
you know, experience, the work experience. And what do you think? Maybe it's a good way just to combine all these potential well-educated person, even if they don't have specific requirements about organic ed education, and just pulling them into one place and exchange of them between these countries and try to do that in the best way. I want to start from Mr. Kerza because I know you have experience in the public entities and now you're in the private sector. So maybe you faced that the problem when you were in the public entities with the well-educated person and how you solve this problem and maybe just exchange experience, share experience about the private sector. It's, it's now it's more easy to attract persons. And after that, we go by round and I'll ask every one of you. Okay. Thank you very much for the question, actually. Really, previously I've been working for Ministry of Foreign Affairs, then Ministry of Defense, where I was Deputy Minister recently and was directly responsible for cybersecurity. And at that moment, we realized that practical cooperation is crucial and sharing is not about information. Huh? We share information for many years. Sharing of people is crucial and very important. That's why I see two good news today. First, we have a very good initiative, which is uh, eager and willing to cooperate and uh, face the same problem and see uh, how much it is important. And those 12, 12 countries and uh, uh, others are clearly understanding how serious the topic is. The second good news is that answers are actually in this room. There are already platforms in place and the one uh, is sitting in uniform. A colonel is running a regional cybersecurity center in Kilnes. It's a practical cooperation center for such countries as us. Uh, it's an initiative with United States and Georgians and Ukrainians where we monitor critical infrastructure. Uh, another topic for them is sharing information and third is training people. And as far as I know, Poland is already joining the center and Poland training equipment is also coming to Kaunas very, very soon. Another uh, problem solving situation is reaction, right? We need to react because it happens still. We don't have enough resources and no one is 100% secure. So my previous colleague is sitting somewhere at the end of the hall with a very beautiful smile, Ausra from Minister of Defense, who is running Cyber Rapid Response Team project. Right? It's a new project, it's already accredited, it's well-trained people physically working in different EU countries that can react to any cybersecurity risk and can be used in any country in military or civil admission. So it's all about people and we all have them in our countries. All we need to do is to combine and at least two platforms are already in place. They are in here. So any reflections from other members? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm probably just going to add uh, digital skills per se is a huge challenge. Uh, I think, uh, and we've seen uh, endless statistics, be it European Union, region, World Economic Forum. What I want to say, and I want to bring this topic back in a context of 3C initiative, which in a part is like to, to gear this cooperation to attract more investment in infrastructure, and we might even say that our human, our people, our human capital is part of infrastructure. So, I mean, I don't mean it literally because that's what the cooperation initially is sought for, is really uh, infrastructure that connects all our countries, digital, transportation, and energy. But obviously the humans and the skills of people is critical, and I think that's where we really need to drive this cooperation to have these big investment projects on core, in core infrastructure that connects us. So our people stay in our region because they are proud of the region. They see the successful growth of different companies and projects across the border. Otherwise, we are losing our brain to Silicon Valley, uh, to European other capitals. So the, the key drive of this whole initiative and the very beginning is to become more attractive as a region in itself to attract more and more investments, starting with a basic infrastructure where digital is one of those. And that, I think, is also the part that helps to attract pe people, helps to drive up their skills, and helps sort of, it's, it's the cycle, how do you get uh, your people to stay here? How do you get them to be more educated? How do you get to 
drive up this demand. So um, I think that's an important point, but we need this economic uh, growth and the success of this region that kind of shares a lot of history, also shares a lot of reasons why some of our infrastructures are still backwards or you need more, need more investment. And uh, it's a good point to also focus on people's skills. Yeah, sure. So, so. Thank you. <clears throat> I would I would go a little bit more deep than than many of you, but of course, uh, uh, if we're talking about critical infrastructure, we, we are usually talking about certain companies' capabilities and uh, and cert teams' capabilities and the interaction between them and so on, so on, so on. This is a very important part of, of uh, cooperation as well, and we know that this kind of a cooperation is not very efficient and well established. It's every every nation is dealing separately. And there are a lot of obstacles of in, in, in sharing information, but especially about common trainings. And this is one very, very high barrier we should overcome. If we like to, uh, if we like to uh, develop our critical infrastructure in a way that we have a common solutions on implementing the, mo the most modern technology and so on and so on. For instance, w we should start from a point at this end. What do, do, we, do we share a common uh, threat assessment about uh, technology we are using? So can we, can we implement the uh, technology in a common way that we, we all assess it as a safe one in an in a absolutely kind of a level? I'm not saying it completely, but at least at, on some kind of a necessary level. But on the other hand, if we're talking about the skills, and, uh, and of course this is a critical uh, moment, and usually we forget that in that regard, we should have a cooperation on the universities and, and school levels as well. If you like to see that our, our that is a common understanding, but what kind of a skills we should develop to interact later on a, on a necessary level. And uh, I'm saying that usually the, the present day is that is understanding that cyber studies are something which are starting on a master's degree level, which is mission impossible to achieve any uh, satisfactory level in, in a society. Should we start somewhere in a high school level already? Because if we're talking about the cyber skills in, a, in a CERT teams or uh, system administrators or IT teams, it's just one thing. But, but the simple user who is working on this critical infrastructure doing some business should be educated as well. So it's, uh, it's much broader than if we're talking about uh, the skills that, that should cover the whole society. And that, that of course, helps to, to create the new jobs and everything else as well. So it's uh, absolutely... Absolutely minimum we should do, and the last date to start with it is, is tomorrow. It's very easy. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, you mentioned education, and maybe it's a one of the solution will be just to create some clusters, specific clusters, just attract more universities to prepare more study programs, even to attract the higher schools. Uh, and after that, if the one country could not just or not able to provide these kind of this of the studies, for example, because of the educational stuff or something, maybe we need to cooperate between three C's initiative and just to harmonize the study program, harmonize the goals that we need to achieve, because we have a lot of different study programs. I think it's 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 even more than half, 50, 50 or 60 different study programs in regarding of the cybersecurity management from IT side, from management, from like reg regulational side. So maybe some clusters which are just harmonizing all these. Yes, of course, I don't like to steal the floor. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Every of you, yeah. But, but I'm, I will re respond very quickly at, at, at any kind of uh, security is about the standards. And, and in, in cyber is absolutely everything is about the standards. But maybe we shouldn't harmonize 100% of all these kind of activities, but at least some, some kind of uh, minimum level we should find, we should be harmonized. And if you, if you take a look, like international companies are sharing um, the qualifications they even don't rely anymore on academic standards, but they have set up somehow their own ones, which they trust. And if a person has been working on, on, on with certain, let's say, software or, or hardware for some period, mm -hmm. they consider it as improved enough that he's capable and qualified to do the next jobs. So it's, um, it's of course, it's about the standards and harmonization about the processes, but maybe we should go, not go so deep to bureaucracy, but keep the flexibility as well, because different 
let's say member states have different uh, different uh, conditions and uh, and that's why that should be kind of a reasonable approach that everybody is capable to to run with the others and to achieve the, the necessary goals thank you maybe a, maybe a quick comment here from the commercial side uh, and also a little bit coming back to your first question what, what we see from our experience it's these days it's much more harder for the government bodies to attract uh, talent because it happens slowly and uh, and the salaries are uh, not so nice and the battle for uh, IT specialists is, is is very 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 intense so therefore we are we shouldn't only to talk about the the standards but we also have to talk about sheer quantity uh, and we are lacking quantity what we also have seen historically that the government consumption is technically out competing the commercial uh, consumption and the more the europe and any other bodies throwing in the money in enabling the cyber infrastructure for the government the, the, the more they are te te technically taking away the talent from the commercial sector so there's an interesting relationship here so therefore the sheer quantity of uh, cyber specialists is, is very important and on the other hand also from our experience in Latvia we've seen that um, starting from the very very early days I mean the uh, the I mean the uh, infantry so to speak for the cyber cyber uh, warriors it mainly comes from the from the commercial companies and this is there's a very 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 important uh, also co cooperation on, on, on that level because the government on its own is most likely is not able to to actually field this kind of, uh, this uh, so, uh, this kind of kind of force no. so everything just stayed on the human resources on the specific knowledges yeah now an address question specific to mr slavomir it's about 5g networks and about your experience and the question is about about opportunity for the 3c initiative company to become the major player on the region of europe regarding the 5g networks can we reach that goal uh, well definitively yes um now uh, i think that what we are missing in this discussion and that, that happens quite often is that uh, we focus just on the networking side of the 5g so it is as if we see just the operator side um, and the services that are provided by that can be provided by the 5g technology but those operators they get the networking gear from somebody they need the networking solutions from from some vendors now this area is often forgotten but that's the actual field mine my, uh, gold field gold mine i would say and, and this is where, where we can really get. Now, instead of looking at the, the challenges as, as a business person, I would try to look at them as, a, as opportunities. So let me point out a couple of, um, of observations. So first of all, the telco system are getting softwareized. So the functionality of the actual network is written in a software. It's not hardware-based, it's software-based then it is disaggregated, which means that uh, the uh, designs that were so far monolithical that could come from just one vendor are possible to be partitioned into, into elements that could be provided by various vendors. Now see the EU um, 5G security toolbox, which points to a threat of dependency on a single supplier which is so important for radio access network because radio access network that's the part that communicates with your phones um, through the antennas that are on the roofs and the servers and the uh, controllers that are just behind this radio access network is wide area network it means it's it, it's huge uh, in, in space i mean if you select in the old days and still now if you select a vendor this vendor will be will have a monopoly in that region um, now how many how many vendors do we have uh, two that are Nordics and two that are uh, let's say or maybe three that are Asian so that's not very healthy that is why EU operators um, the five five EU operators they ex expressly indicated that they want disaggregated systems the ones that are coming from a number of vendors not just from one vendor uh, US is indicating the same 
then the production, production uh, and manufacturing and actually implementation of system is getting localized. It is deglobalizing. Uh, those uh, threats that we are talking about, uh, they push us to really think about local implementations. And we as countries are also kind of forced by the situations to work together. And we have a lot of things in common that has been said already. This region is typically very strong in abstract thinking, in mathematics. And that goes well uh, with the software um, design and with the software implementation. So uh, taking these old things into account, uh, we can build the vendor that is uh, solving and fulfilling the needs that we have on the, on the three, in the Trishis region, but it, which is also able to export those solutions um, to other countries, to our, in our transatlantic relations or to European Union. Uh, that, that's very important. Imagine if we don't have to license network solutions from the Nordics or from the Asians, if we have our own vendors, how much money we could save and keep in our region, how much money we could earn by selling those licenses elsewhere into the world. The, the situation is even more important because the network capacities that need to be fulfilled or the, the, the demand for the traffic is exponentially rising. But those two plus two or two plus three vendors are unable to follow this exponential rise. So a change of business model is, is, a, is a must. And th this is actually what is happening right now. Uh, so uh, th this is really, this is really a, an opportunity of a lifetime, I would say, for our region to work together um, to identify what kind of capabilities we have, then to form um, an environment in, in which we could really work together and help each other, and then just to benefit. But those benefits are really long-term long benefits. We, we cannot think in a short-term benefits of, okay, guys, uh, let's compare a, a vendor from our region and, um, let's say, 100 years old Nordic vendor and compare them just by the price point. That, that, that's, that, but that's how, how it's happening right now. And we have to change that. So I think that uh, what has been said already, that we have aligned our values, that's very important. We perceive ourselves friends, that's very important. But it's not sufficient. I think the sufficient point is to uh, identify our interests and align those interests so that it will pay off simply for us and for our partners, the target market that we have and the target partnership that we would, li would like to establish uh, with the three six region. So you mentioned quite an interesting problem. It's some kind of like the paradox. We have a lot of needs regarding the networks and 5G. We have a lot of well-educated persons. We have high IT companies. It's a profitable future to build this. So why we don't have the vendors enough still now? You're just saying we're a lot of them of different countries. We need to produce here, here, but as I understood, we're not producing right now. We're just trying to do that. So it's the question of the cooperation between maybe government and business, or maybe we need some press or help from the government entities, from the regulators. Where is the problem? It's a question for all, for all of you orientated. Just let's start from, from previous. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, not, not really. I would say that the, that the point is uh, we do have such vendors. Now, we are representing one yeah. of those vendors, but we are, are, of course, inclusive. So we are here with a mission to search for partnerships. And we would like to uh, work um, together, actually, under the, um, uh, the, the term 5G made together. Uh, but the, the point is in, in the mentality. Uh, we are small, we have started, so we can be perceived as, let's say, a teenager, a teenage challenger. But we are put in the boxing match with Mike Tyson right now. So this is the unfairness of the perception of the decision makers that is happening. So we need to change this, this mindset. We, are, uh, we, we need to point out at the long-term benefits that we could achieve by growing, by the homegrown. Um, it, it doesn't 
uh, apply only for the 5G. It applies for all the other, let's say, digital skills. Uh, we, we need to point out at the long-term perspectives of what we can do um, together and how we could benefit in, lo in the long term also uh, leveraging our relations in a transatlantic direction or with EU because it really works perfectly um, together. So I would say that the major challenge for that is in the mindset that we have. And this mindset is very much based on the past experience. But the past will not tell you anything about the future in this case. I mean, small ads. So we have the situation that, let's say, from the side of the technology, the same, same requirements, we lead them, we pass them. So the main question, I think, is the price. So maybe you are not able to competitive with the, regarding the price or just opinion about small companies and about experience. If you don't have enough experience, so that means you're not so attractive for the big companies. They are afraid of your future possibilities and so on. Very fast answer. I can give you a, 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 an example. Uh, we are in a, a tender where the requirement is to prove that you have installed uh, a number set of you know yeah. this type of equipment before. So uh, for the newcomer, is is a stopover. Yeah, there know, is no discussion. Yeah, it's a small also joke and example about Lithuanian road companies which build the roads. 1995 one of the necessary obligations, you need to have experience of the building the roads. After the five yeah. years of the independence, That's how the many point. companies have the experience of building roads? And what about the private sector and, 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 and why the new companies which pro produce the same technology maybe with the same requirements and so on are not so attractive or... I have so many feelings. Uh, I will try to uh, structure my answer somehow about this topic, me being a mobile operator. Of course, I've yeah. been thinking about the 5G for the last five years now, so uh, a little bit dizzy. But the first thing about the mindset is I think one thing we should uh, bear, we, we normally don't talk about it. And also in the previous uh, panel, there was this sentence that we should somehow catch up with the, with the West, which is totally not true in terms of uh, telecommunications. West should catch up with us. Germany and, and France are about 10 years uh, behind us in terms of uh, actual consumption of telecommunications, uh, at least I, I could clearly talk on behalf of all of the Baltic countries. We can clearly see the indicators that consumption of mobile technology and, and then fiber technology, only Finland and somehow, somehow, strangely, Austria is a little bit ahead of us, but the rest of the Europe is clearly behind. So being about, about the mindset, we are not that small or, or you know, so, so that backwards. This is one thing. The other thing is, is also a strange notion that um, we, have, we are attending conferences and happenings about the 5G and, and, and everybody is afraid or expecting or, you know, and celebrating, but technically no one needs it. So other than uh, if you, everybody knows what you and, or, or, or somebody else will do with the 5G within 10 years, but nobody n normally is talking about what are you going to do with the 5G within uh, one year. So this is just uh, some stupid uh, fantasies about a fast broadband, which is a, uh, a very, very old problem which is already solved. So the, the, this big thing is about the 5G use case and this has brought us very much, at least in our Latvian ecosystem, which that has created this pull that many different industries and the government is actually, are actually coming together and doing this step zero. The step zero is very hard and depressive, but you have to identify what is the target, what is the objective and actually, and this actually brings ecosystem together in trying to achieve some success. The first thing you have to identify, what are you going to do? So and there are actually, and I'm a little bit building on what was just discussed, uh, we also have some examples where we actually prove to ourselves that we are not that dependent on Chinese, literally. So there is no, because the, back in the days, there was this idea that somehow everything has to be manufactured in China for some reason, because, I don't know, cheap labor, which is, of course, a very old and old story, which doesn't hold true these days. So, for instance, we joined forces with our producer, it's called Microtik, it's Microtik, it's <laughs> advertisement. So we created joint, joint lab, and actually we proved that we are able to substitute uh, Huawei's end user equipment like routers. So the 4G and 5G routers these days are being produced in Latvia at, at roughly the same price point. So this is possible. So we are these days looking for the next step is are we able to produce also 5G modules? 
and 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 uh, being here, I also would like to take the opportunity is if there is anybody who, in in some angle, would like to cooperate, we we would be more than happy to 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 uh, join forces because the networking is of course one of the key key elements for success here uh, and for the region as a whole. Thank you. So, do we need specific help from the from the regulator entity regarding that? You just said that we are able to. Produce. It's called supply chain security. That there is a there is a name for it. Uh, it's been invented, <laughs> uh, or um, strategic autonomy might be the other name. And it's quite rational these days, as as the end of uh, era of gl globalization is uh, going down. Just on time method is not celebrated anymore. So clearly, uh, one way how we call it um, back home in, in Latvia is security of supply chain. So and also the uh, all the history today in Ukraine also shows that security of supply chain is of utmost importance and just on time uh, doesn't work really. So that is clearly a role for the government and the regulator. And Ms. Yeva, what you If I can just add, I think, uh, and I, I ha maybe have more freedom on sort of different companies mentioning, uh, Ingmar's mentioned Mikrotik, and he's, they are one of the unique companies actually in Europe who produces routers already, what, 20 years? Uh, so it actually is a technical know-how servicing uh, around the globe. But it is really difficult to scale up if there is, or scale farther up in a sense, if there is not this requirement because the market and any telecoms will go for a cheaper production that they can use. And that is heavily subsidized. We know by now, we know that it's subsidized in China in multiple ways. Uh, so uh, we've been discussing, you know, we've been discussing in America, who is a very strong anti-China sort of uh, technology mood, yet you cannot get, you know, AT&T to provide routers uh, to their clients that are produced in EU, NATO sort of certified state. Rather than, and that's where the standards, I think, and the requirements, it's not, it not necessarily has to be going politically against someone, but it has to be a very clear standards uh, that uh, we need for security. Uh, we need, you know, for privacy, for security yeah. reasons, being re reliable and, and trusted as used here uh, in, in connectivity context. And that very much stems from where it's produced and how it, uh, how it is insured. And so I think regulators, or in a sense, this government body is different ways, whether it's a Brussels regulation, overall EU or national, they do come in. And yeah, I think yeah. we need to explain an, or about our example, if you ain't an example about with adopted specific law, that just allows us... Very correct, very correct. I hear you and you guys, and I think uh, Lithuania has some part of the solution. Uh, new legislation is uh, starting from 1st of April, so one week in Lithuania, we changed the laws saying that if you are a governmental institution or critical infrastructure like telco, you cannot buy IT or telecommunication equipment from countries who are not compatible with national cyber security, uh, with national um, security, and there is a special list, China, Russia, Belarus, Crimea, and all occupied by Russia parts of territories. So, if the company comes from there, you cannot buy. Then, critical infrastructure like us, we need to, to search for something like, you said, Microtech, like your company, right? And give you opportunities to provide those services and equipment that could be implemented in our in our, in our ways, you have the obligation just to yes. ask to prove that you are not yes. connected to... Yes, correctly. So, if the company is owned by China, you cannot buy. If uh, it is from Russia, service or equipment doesn't matter. Warranty doesn't matter. You cannot buy. And it's already in place for one week. So, we will see how we do it. May I have a question? Sure. Sorry. What? One question: yeah. What if uh, what if uh, the company is, uh, let's say, from Scandinavia, but it produces things in China? Well, it would be a good question to our Minister of Defense because, as I said, it's a very new thing, right? But if all um, how you call that in English? beneficial owners, ben yeah, are no. Chinese, 
It's not allowed. If it's EU, NATO, or whatever, it's okay. Because it's not just prohibited to be produced in China. Yeah, it's just no. the place of the manufacturing, but the beneficials, control system, software developing system, all this monitoring system should be from the lies. But that reminds a bit of, of a situation. I was a reviewer of EU projects some time ago, and uh, I was fresh after university, uh, really believing in the stories that we need those projects to boost the European cooperation. And I've seen Huawei there. So yeah. I asked the reviewers, hey guys, but that's not European company. But they said, come on, that's Huawei Stockholm, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah, we will see. I, I just say that uh, we have first steps, how to deal. We will see. Of course, China and Russia are smart guys, right? They always find a workaround. But we need to work to find those workarounds and stop them. Yeah, uh, I, I just want to agree that Latvia has the same, and I think Bolts in, in common has the same principle. We also have prohibited in a legal way to use uh, that equipment. But I say that there, I, I wanted to say that exactly like you said, you know, it's Huawei, but pro, uh, Stockholm and other ways. What we have noticed is a lot in in these technologies is that it's produced somewhere in Asia, not in China. Uh, as a, you know, you set a third party, you set a new business unit, yeah. but it's technically still all these components, and that's why I think EU is very much discussing going down to specific technical requirements to make sure that those, be it backdoors, be it sort of all kind of remote possibilities to interfere and, and attack or, or uh, abuse, that they are not built within technologies uh, regardless uh, uh, where they are uh, produced. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, the, the, here is something which I mentioned in the very beginning, that, that, that the cooperation between these countries is possible just in a case we share a threat assessment. Yeah. And the threat assessment, of course, should be a political one, is, is absolutely for sure. But I'm not talking about a political threat assessment team. I'm talking about the assessment about the technology. This should be understood commonly. And in that regard, and after that, everything else is you can make the next steps to go forward. And I completely agree with what our Polish colleague said that uh, there maybe there are some kind of a new business models needed to, to create the new things. But here is one point. He absolutely made a very good uh, statement is that if we can create a new solutions and standards for security, we can have a huge benefit on that. But there are Ma majority of these are not the technical aspects, but the legal aspects we, sh we should work with, actually. It's about the data, it's about some other things. And uh, so it's, it's a long list we have to do. So, so it needs a very tenacious cooperation. And finally, the question remains that should we implement it just only in a free seas area or is it uh, the European Union common standards then? Like what, is, what is a kind of... And my question back would be looking from business perspective to you, Reiner. How do we get, uh, you know, know everybody acknowledges the cybersecurity threats. And so EU will designate a lot of um, money to innovate. And we already know where that money will go uh, in, a, in a very known uh, know-how hubs in sort of more of West part. So the question is, how do we get them here in three Cs? How do we make this region so attractive? Yeah, but I think it starts from a point that our uh, Academic cooperation is much more poor when when investing part. I think traditionally, I'm not talking about in a cyber, but in traditionally, because they have already uh, building up the platforms for decades, for hundreds of years sometimes, which are still functional and yeah. uh, and there are just interaction behind. So we can transfer it to a new spheres of uh, of uh, sciences and research and development as well. And that's why I think this free free seas fund can be one very important tool for if you like to deal with a development of a infrastructure on this framework, on digital or whatever. So it's, we need just kind of a framework. That there should be frames always. I, should, uh, I would like to a little bit add to what Reiner just said about the universities and academia. I think this is one big issue. I think we have identified uh, and acknowledged back in Latvia that somehow this link between the corporations and universities is somewhat broken. And the scientists, they have learned to live on their own. They like f uh, feeding on, on, I don't know, on EU money and funds. And this is going somewhat nowhere because they are doing their stuff and, you know, living along, but there is no link with the industry. And then if you take a look at the st statistics about the uh, Western Europe, then you see that from R&D investment, 
from two thirds to three quarters of all the R&D investment come from big companies. It's not from the government, it's not from the startups, it's actually the big, the big companies. And in many countries in the region, in this science and R&D ecosystem, the big companies are not present. So this is one of the motions we are now trying to solve, is how to rebuild this a big and wide and strong bridge between the, cor between the companies and the scientists and also bring back these big mammals into this <laughs> R&D uh, &D ecosystem. And this is also not topic only about the IT and cybersecurity, but this is, is of also one of the examples, clearly. Yeah, and just a small reflection about the regulation and legal requirements. Yeah, our side is big, big, big problem is intellectual property and, and, and all this intellectual tools and so on and the reverse engineering prohibition of reverse engineering if you are producing some software the Monsieur mentioned the back doors and so on yeah we need to think about it how to how to ensure and guarantee that we are able to analyze the software and, and the technology or the f even the hardware and software in behavior with the intellectual property how to not how to pass all requirements but to be guaranteed next the question was Mr. To, to you will be just addressed, Mr. Reiners. It's about uh, Estonian development and, 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 and concept of the trusted connectivity, if you are just trying to, 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 to introduce. And maybe it's, it's free seas initiative and the countries from the sea, it will be best place to, 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 to test it and then to try to do it in tomorrow, even after the month, just to do, not to talk, not to have the plans, but just implement. It's, it's just theoretical, it's possible or not. And what we need, if we want to do that, it's a political question, it's a government power question, or investment question. Yes, I'm, I'm not representing government anymore. Yeah. So it's <laughs> or, or for long already. So it's, um, I, I, I just, I was just connected to this initiative just on the very beginning, uh, as the government started with that. And of course, it's a question about, uh, it's a question about the investments in, in our cooperation and, and and how can we, can we trust the investments that different countries are doing in, for their infrastructure if we like to develop it in a common way is one of the big questions. But I think that mm, private companies uh, represent a business uh, interest usually, and that's about the state's authority to verify if there's something gets behind or not. And uh, it's not just the political problems, and it's not the questions about um, uh, let's say, political motivation in different countries to manipulate with uh, investments just in their favor. But it's about the taxation system, uh, intellectual property, and some other legal elements which are very, very important. And I'm, I go back to what our Polish colleagues said. If we do something in common, and this added very, very well that, that the intellectual property is, is one of the very important issues that, that who will get this? if we create something new, and how we can make this intellectual property to generate the new money and new businesses. But if the governments are not creating this environment, which we can say that, yes, we trust uh, the investments, in that, uh, if, if the governments are not doing that, are not capable to implement this, we will see kind of a mess in different member states. And the idea about this trusted uh, environment is to attract the big, really big money globally to come to this region and, uh, and to create something which is a completely new in a, in a sphere of infrastructure. So it, I, I totally agree that this is a big challenge for these governments which are usually not even meeting with each other on the necessary level to, to talk about these topics. So how long it takes and how uh, fast these governments are capable to implement this, it's it's question which, of course, um, I am not capable to answer. But as much as I understand, there is an idea to cooperate with OECD to, to create this kind of a trusted of the different standards and or and um, if if we, are we if we can do it i think we we can see a real high possibility to attract our our nice partners from different uh, regions of the world to to work with our projects 
But at the moment, if you can imagine that all the countries should approach different, uh, different foundations of funds in, in, in different way, this cooperation is not working out. I'm absolutely, okay. uh, I'm absolutely confident about it. So once again, the same problem, yeah? We have a lot of different needs, a lot of needs. As you mentioned, you build the road, just give me car, or a lot of cars. You have the 5G, just invent the services, invent wearable devices, invent small energy consuming devices. Just think about it, because if we have needs, we will have small of all these devices, we will need to have the network. Mr. Kerza, you are representing the from industry, energy industry, and all these new Internet of Things devices is also very important at your business, I think so. All, all these all matters. So what about specific needs of the business to the network providers or to the communication providers? Yes, indeed. We are doing now at the moment very innovative, I would say, projects, which is called smart meters. So very soon in every house we'll have new type of meters which are wirelessly connected and they are smart, right? So on one hand, it's very innovative. On the other hand, it's so new and might be vulnerable right? and dangerous because if you break into the system, you might you know, shut down the whole city or even the country because it will be installed in every apartment, in every company. So we clearly understand that the innovation is moving forward right? and you need to provide to your clients new services. right? And smart meters can provide that because we can tell them what are their habits, how can they uh, use their electricity in a more smart way, how it can be combined with their uh, solar plant or wind plant, whatever, which is standing somewhere, even maybe not in Lithuania or in Poland, whatever, right? Because I can buy a solar plant which is in Poland and maybe as it is a common market, electrical market, maybe I can use the electricity which is produced in another country through, uh, through in this region, right, use it in Lithuania. So. It, it will be here very soon, but on another hand, then what are standards for smart meters in terms of cybersecurity? What needs to be done? Who has the answer? What needs to be done so that the, the whole project would be 100% secure? Right? So maybe the answer is that the specific clusters of the Free C initiative. Correct. For example, one the area is the energy, consumption, matter, so on. Other is the network, infrastructure, all these devices, routers, browsers, uh, as you have your company. You are presenting the 5G and so on. You are presenting safe networking and so on, trusted networks. So maybe it's one of the way, just start from the simplest things. Just, just announce them that we have this, we are able to produce this. Just if you have the problem, ask, we will help to solve it. So I would, uh, from the operator side, I would uh -huh. re really agree to uh, be very effective somewhat to share this certification and investigation part, particularly of these small things, because they, com they come in great n numbers and they're supposed to be cheap. And uh, for many use cases, they're sometimes it's not like in millions. They might come, I don't know, in, 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 in uh, ten thousands for my market, which is not a very big vol uh, volume, but I still have to check it. So, of course, doing this in a, the scale, efficiencies of scale for the 3C region would be um, very clear. So, if I have checked it or, or my, I don't know, friends from Czechia or from Poland have uh, done this work, so I, I, I am probably free of it, so I, I should not waste my resources. So, I think sharing the knowledge on, for instance, this very particular issue, like control of cybersecurity of all the IoT, uh, ecosystem would be a very, very, very uh, useful initiative. Yeah, from that side. And other very important things is the main threats of cybersecurity in, in your own business, for example. Have you indicated them? Let's start from you. The main threats of cybersecurity for your 5G, for example, producing business. It's related with, with what? With human problem, with, with software problem, <coughs> vulnerabilities, and, and just top three of main cybersecurity threats for your business, from your own. Well, <laughs> we took a lot of precautions to uh, safeguard a lot of areas recently, so yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going to talk much about it. Yeah, yeah. But because uh, we are aware of the fact that this is a hot topic. Uh, 
uh, and that, that we are working on something that, that's not only nationally important, but, but also globally. Uh, but I, I, I can just, in general words, tell you that uh, we were, um, for our business, we improved our uh, physical uh, as well as uh, virtual uh, IT infrastructure. And also we work on procedures, we work on people. Uh, it's a very multi-dimensional um, issue uh, for, for running a business. Um, so I think we are, we are prepared, but uh, the risk is always there. So you cannot say that you are 100% immune to those uh, threats. Uh, we work, we collaborate with uh, partners that, that are there to, to help us. Um, but honestly, I uh, see more kind of a business threats uh, in other areas, and that's, that's what I was trying to explain in, in the mentality, um, in the uh, way laws are created, because uh, we, we were talking about the role of the governments. So I think that the role of the government should be minimal, but it should safeguard, first of all, that the rules are really uh, fair and they, they are really... Um, uh, they are removing, let's say, oligopolies and monopolies. And that's not the case right now. So the basic things are the threats, not the, 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 the technologically complex ones, because uh, those we are handling somehow, we understand them. Yeah. And, okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's, I'm, I'm working in a company which is dealing mostly with cyber capability and capacity building, which means trainings and, uh, and uh, exercises and such kind of stuff. But we develop our technology as well. And, and of course, it's a paradoxic thing that uh, the point that uh, we have uh, engaged a lot of engineers who are deep experts in cyber uh, defense. They know very well different solutions, technical ones. And we are, tra and we are, we are always going and selling ourselves and teaching that, that uh, human Human link is a, is a weakest. weakest one anyway. You should, because still you give uh, the access to the same database for every single person in your company. Usually there are not every single one is such a deep and expert. But in our case, it's kind of a paradox that we never have been committing any training for our employees and ourselves. So we just two weeks ago, we were sitting down and thinking that we should do it self as is, even if we are working out, we are very complex exercises, but if you're not training your own personnel, you will be failed finally anyway. So this is this comes at first, always. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Well, uh, from my experience, how Russia is uh, aggressively acting against critical infrastructure, I see two waves. One is on information, public information, which is available in our computers. It might be everything from emails to contracts as the um, probably eight years ago, understood that their physical network uh, was disturbed and they need to find new ways of collecting intel. And this is through breaking into networks and stealing those, uh, those pieces of information that are later on are used for disinformation and for planning. Another part uh, which I see is getting to scatter systems and uh, finding ways to those closed uh, closed systems, in our case it's energy uh, uh, sector, uh, in other cases uh, we had uh, uh, attacks on water uh, pump infrastructures in Lithuania, on governmental um, special uh, agencies and so on. So uh, they are always trying to do harm, right? Break and cut. So very correctly said. The, the, people are, are most crucial probably and the, the weakest point. So, and they, and they have all information in their computers. And Ms. Yeva, your reflection I, to that? Yeah, I mean, I'm sitting in president's office so I will not speak on behalf of company, but I did a quick uh, sort of um, update from my national cert team to see how things are going within the last, let's say, three months. I, I, I will just share observations of their work uh, in a sense that um, we've been pushing uh, the message out in a very different ways already since December, that there will be, that everybody has to be on a high alert in a technology domain, that people, companies uh, have to be prepared to face some attacks. 
uh, their uh, observations through these e uh, through these months, you know, before and you know, as January and then the start, the crisis, the war built up, and then the war itself. That you can see more massive scanning of systems. There is a hu bigger interest, but you don't see big massive attacks. What actually happens? Uh, there is a bigger scan. And then there is a silence, and there is apparently very professionally targeted whatever has been scanned out. And then where the incidents happen, uh, smaller scale incidents, that the conclusion is that it's actually the level of professional people who were not able to catch up. So it's not, in a way, we have been talking a lot that the human factor is the weakest link in a sense that your user, you know, sometimes give up, I don't know, password on the social networks or something else. Uh, what they have observed through these last three months, when one can say there has been a more, a bigger interest uh, scanning and find, uh, looking for most likely vulnerabilities, etc., then if there is any failure or if there is any incident, the smaller scale again, then it's on a professional side. Uh, basically, we do need to level up uh, the cybersecurity professionals working, be it a government sector or be it a private sector. That was very one, um, one observation and another one that it's a very typical that incidents come from this sort of supply, uh, supply chain attack that yeah. actually they found vulnerability but uh, uh, in a be it service provider, software, connectivity, some other services, but the target is not the company itself but uh, it targets uh, then uh, the one who uses the services. So this uh, supply chain security, you know, going through all the elements, knowing who provides what services or what uh, technologies your company or government uses, is actually they've been seeing this in action, that the attacks or successful incidents have not been directly, uh, but actually going through the supply chain. Thank you. Sure probably have three reflections on uh, past, future, and uh, present. In the past, probably being a mobile operator, of course, cybersecurity is, is, a, is, a, is a constant uh, thing you're watching out. And, and there is a thing called a common sense. And somehow we are proud that long before Mr. Trump showed up, uh, it was quite understandable for us, without telling, that buying a, a core network from uh, Chinese co Communist Party is probably not a very uh, good idea. So I think that that's, that's, it's always a question of common sense. It's not all, only a poli political direction. You have to bit think uh, and, and ha have some historical perspective. Speaking about the future, uh, getting ready for 5G implementation and, and actually get and reacting to what's being bu building up in geopolitically recently actually our many activities these days are related not so much on the getting ready for a peacetime trouble but to actually look what is the operator's role in the actual war and so we have um, been very closely cooperating with the armed, with armed forces of uh, Latvia uh, physically participating in different kind of exercises uh, uh, placing our physical infrastructure uh, in different kind of uh, cyber exercises, uh, building up a, f a 5G uh, test site, uh, a military test site to actually investigate um, both the 5G functionality, mesh networks, integrating different players in the, the region because uh, therefore, uh, because as we can see in the present, um, this example from U Ukraine tells us m many stories. Number one, of course, that the human factor is super cr uh, critical. The recent story of that part of Ukraine network were shut down because some of the employees of the operator were left b uh, behind in the front lines and the actual credentials were uh, 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 received from them or pulled out from, from from them, which gave access to the action. So you, 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 you can build whatever you want, but if if your uh, personal stays behind, <coughs> stays um, behind, that that's a, a clear problem. And but f on the other hand, finishing on the more brighter notion, I would really, really would like to meet uh, some of the heroes from the operators, uh, personnel who are right now still in the besieged uh, uh, Mariupol and still able to maintain some part of uh, telecommunications up. This is a miracle, and I, 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 I would be really honored someday to learn how they actually, how they have been able to pull this off. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's true. You know, mm, if we look at the 
cybersecurity strategies of all our countries, we will find one of the most important principles, cyber culture level. We need to increase it all the time and it states on our strategies. I'm 100% sure that every strategy talks about it, about cyber security culture level. And you mentioned the human factor. So maybe we need just to force government to implement some specific requirements, additional requirements for the cybersecurity culture level, beginning from the school and universities. And after that, it should be dynamic, checked, for example, each year, each two years. It's not depend on the companies itself. I know that you are evaluating yourself, you are evaluating your, as you mentioned, you will be evaluating yourself and your employees, but maybe we need just a statement by the law. For example, it's not allowed to decide by yourself. You need to guarantee to us that you are evaluating person. I don't know, it's time period, never, never mind, but, but still, maybe we need to think about it, about specific obligation to prove that we are still able to use technologies. Example, driving license and medical carrier. We need to pass exams, we need to pass each 10 years, for example, but it's not, it's a bad example, but still. It could be some kind of the same. I just remember specific requirements to have European computer driving license, a CDL. I think you remember that. That's that certificate that shows that you are able to work with technology. Now at least the 10 years is not, not required anymore, I think so. But still, maybe we need to think about it. One Reinvent the something. One of the ways how to approach it is just like in the army. You, 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 you need a drill. So there, uh, like for the like last five, six years, more than 70 different companies in Latvia yearly are involved in, in a drill. It's starting from uh, bakeries and down to the, I don't know, uh, forestry companies. So what they exactly will do and uh, how they will act, are they capable, what are the uh, problems? So this is a yearly training uh, that that's probably the way. I mean, we have to a little bit reshuffle the thinking about that the commercial sector is not something different from the state, so yeah. you are also a part of the bigger picture. I'd like yeah. to stress, of course, our companies dealing with training, but it's anyway, <laughs> training, it's, it's all about the training permanently. And I can draw this kind of example. We, we have been working with uh, some multinational um, trainings. We've, uh, in, in Europe, we've uh, different nations presented where we were different authorities. And um, for our great surprise, it worked out that we have been never interacting with each other before. And that happened some years ago on cyber. I mean, that that's talks quite a lot about. I'm not yeah. talking about the forensics or, or something. It's it's well, it's kind of a framework and uh, efforts to interact with each other, but on just on legal basis. But here is a huge gap, which is not fulfilled yet. So it's not easy way to find the easiest way to solve it. But I think it touches the broader problem because our countries are quite well connected east to west, but they are not that well connected north south. And this is what we are talking about. But this requires also a thinking about our identity as a three seas region. Who do we want to be? Uh, and how do we want to position ourselves versus the, the EU, the west, the east, um, the US, um, what is our message to them, what we will bring, what benefits we will bring to them, uh, what are our interests, what interests they can realize with us. And if we don't answer those questions, then I think uh, it will be very difficult to uh, synchronize any, any activities on, on, on that uh, north-south uh, you know, region. And everything, I think, starts from awareness. So ho I hope uh, I believe that what we are doing here is to, we are building the awareness and we are uh, getting some activities already. We are trying uh, to, to do some, some of those things. Um, but that really needs also a, a thinking about who, who do we want to be because uh, each of us, when asked, I think would answer a bit, different, uh, a bit differently. So that, that should be kind of streamlined. So we, we feel safe with our vision. There should be a kind of a vision, I think, behind. So once again, exchange of information, specific clusters, or we have already specific clusters, so maybe join them, share of the needs, and after that, your interest, unify the position, and represent ourselves outside of the 3C initiative. 
I have a specific question for the keynote speaker, if, if you're allowed to ask. Maybe you have some specific examples of the practical implementation of cooperation between public and the private sector, the best examples. We were talking about, about some clusters, but maybe you have some examples regarding that from your experience. From my experience. Of the uh, best cooperation between public entities and the private sector or private sector themselves. I think that we still need to boost that uh, partnership. Uh, as I said in my keynote, we can observe that practical cooperation now between uh, Ukrainian companies and the Ukrainian uh, government. Uh, that's for sure. Um, and uh, I know that uh, there is, for instance, the cooperation between uh, the European uh, companies with uh, European Commission in the form of European Cybersecurity Organization. They are sharing um, their needs, specific needs, and they are trying to apply it for the structure of, for instance, uh, um, uh, European funds, uh, which will be allocated for cybersecurity projects. So this type of information sharing, uh, um, information sharing in that respect, not mention the, 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 the cyber threat uh, intelligence, but, but uh, to uh, cooperate on how we should spend uh, European funds, for instance, but then uh, the public-private cooperation in terms of information sharing uh, in uh, the uh, critical uh, sectors is, of course, also important, and I think that we need to create now uh, some sectoral search to, to boost that public-private cooperation. Um, and uh, uh, then uh, I, I think that we should develop some um, accelerators uh, which will help to boost that co cooperation definitely and uh, which will um, also be able to answer the strategic needs of our countries and companies should be definitely involved in all uh, levels uh, of, uh, of, of that cooperation. Thank you for our experience. And you were mentioned about quantum computing and so on. I just remember one month ago I read very interesting scientific article. It was a serious article from the very powerful journal, scientific journal. And we have new definition, scientific definition, quantum apocalypsis. It was quite interesting to read about it, about quantum apocalypsis as the challenges for all cybersecurity and so on. It was technical article regarding the calculations and possibilities, theoretical possibilities. And I, for me, it was, I was surprised that before that it was some, from the kind of the fantasy and so on, quantum apocalypse, and now it's just definition, scientific definition. And the last question for the finalization, artificial intelligence and the solution, maybe for the free season initiation, artificial intelligence, all, all, all these challenges or even opportunities to produce some kind of the software, even in just combined with this, the hardware, yeah, we know that we have specific regulation of European Union. We have Green Book regarding the artificial intelligence. We know that we are in the weak part of the world because American and, and, and the Asian countries, they just move forward and forward regarding the intelligence innovative. We have some legal problem with that. But just what if we will solve that problem? It will be attractive for companies and for, for the members. Just, yeah, because it's some kind also of threats. Why is the European Union so, so afraid of, of just pushing the artificial intelligence solution to the business? They are just saying we have problems with the data protection, with intellectual property, and so on. But maybe we need to change something. It's just a nice talking point to, to share. It's like apocalyptic. You can push money towards something that, um, uh, that scientists should deal with, but I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm not thinking that it's any kind of a practical issue at the moment. Yeah. Because it's just uh, hypothetic and theoretical uh, yeah. kind of a question and nobody has seen how it will be solved. But, but of course, there is usually tradition that all these kind of uh, technical renewables are implemented in military domain at first. First of all. And that, that actually scares up all, everybody, I think. So. And all cryptography and so on, just a lot of questions of that. So do we have any reflections? Uh, I can maybe add on artificial intelligence. I think uh, it's already there. I mean, I don't know how intelligent, but certainly some artifi artificial... Sort of Machine moment. learning There has system. been a lot of discussion of this terminology, how yeah. properly it is to say what, but of course, 
we can see machines learning and you know learning from as they learn and continuing to implement uh, uh, sort of making decisions and providing services and etc. Uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, it's not uh, if but uh, when. when. So artificial intelligence is there; it's coming. Uh, I think uh, it's like cybersecurity. It's about who and how we'll set the, set the standards. A lot of that is ethical standards. I mean, you know, it's a lot of that been talking about facial recognition and how it's that is applying. Uh, it's a lot about speaking about surveillance. It's a lot about talking about how can you argue back with that intelligence if the decisions are made wrongful or the data fed in are biased, uh, incorrect. So I think it's a lot about setting common standards uh, to avoid particularly the same problems that we have in cybersecurity, that you know, we build a big powerful systems and then we face, uh, face problems. But I think Europe, uh, EU is trying to think ahead. Uh, so yeah. therefore there are those uh, already uh, political papers uh, probably will turn into some regulation. I don't think necessarily that it will stop innovation, but I think the data solution between uh, US and Europe on data sharing, that is, of course, important moment to build your intelligence and capability to, to predict and calculate. Yeah. Thank you. To be very honest, I did not think we have a problem with artificial intelligence until you asked, uh, because we use it, really. Already. Uh, there is artificial intelligence that helps to fight Russian disinformation but in a, any language, actually. Uh, and it helps for professionals to, to find those lies in, 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 in networks. On the other hand, I know another program and another artificial intelligence that, that is uh, helping to find those unknown cyber attacks. And the only obligation, as far as I know, is about weaponry systems, that you cannot use artificial intelligence in unmanned uh, Control system, yeah. killing systems, which is on a human, right? Because yeah. a human needs to take a decision, so. And no, you can't use also, I mean, what the EU anonymously decided that you can't use, you can't build this social credit system like it's done in yeah, China. In so China's you can't apply intelligence, apply uh, artificial intelligence, uh, limiting people's freedoms. Yeah. Uh, so that's another, not only military, but... Uh, and yeah, one problem we solved because we adopt new directive in 2019. 19, yes, it's, it's regarding the intellectual property and so on. So we change copyright protection for the machine learning and so on data sets organization. So if you need or if you want to create some machine learning system, now you're able to collect a lot of data even if it's protected by copyright. But just for the machine learning system, just to educate machine to just just to know, to, to understand and so on. It was very important to change that law because a lot of scientific data scientific they just ask change the law because we're not able to analyze and so on. So yeah, for the beginning. We have done because we just passed a bit more 10 minutes from that. I want to thanks again for our speakers. It was a pleasure to be here. And thanks for the Polish Embassy to organizing this meeting. Thank you. Thanks for everyone. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, as we just finished, I guess, this part of our seminar, on behalf of our embassy, I would like to thank you very much for accepting our invitation and being with us here tonight. I think it's very important to underline that this is the common project of our embassy, which was organized in a close collaboration with the Lithuanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Embassy of Latvia in Vilnius, the Embassy of Estonia in Vilnius, and the Embassy of United States in Vilnius. And I would like to thank my colleagues for their really great cooperation for the last few months, actually, that we have been working on this event. I would like to also thank our distinguished panelists, the keynote speaker, Ms. Isabella Albrecht, chairwoman of the program committee of CyberSec Forum, member of the Council of Digitalization and the Chancellery of the Prime Minister of Poland, Mr. Sławomir Pietrzyk, president and CEO of the IS Wireless, Mr. Edwina Skerca, uh, the head of the Business Resilience Unit at Ignitis, uh, Mr. Ignar Spukis, uh, Vice President of the LMT Mobile uh, Corporation. Mr. Rainer Zaks, Member of the Executive Board of Cybex Technologies. Ms. Jeva Ilves, Digital Policy Advisor to the President of Latvia. And last but not the least, our great moderator, 
Dr. Marius Laurinaitis. Thank you very much. Uh, having said that, I would like to invite you to the reception, which is going to take place just there, by this door.